and it's almost it's almost like plankton from spongebob yeah holy <laughs> shit that's, ex- that's exactly what he sounds like i couldn't unhear it dude <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not gonna be able to unhear it either Welcome to Every Album Ever with Mike and Alex. My name is Michael Mansour, and I'm joined, as always, by my happy patient co-host, Alexander Volt. Say hello. Totally did not finish taking notes in front of your house in my car right now. We're going to get into that. This is Every Album Ever, the podcast. We listen to every single album in the world, one artist at a time. That's a whole new discography per episode. And today, we'll be discussing, finally, every album by... No Means No. No Means No. This, I believe, this band... I believe has taken the fucking trophy for most requested band in the entire history of the show. That's insane to me. Yeah. Uh, they surpassed even swans. I think Holy I've been shit. getting tons of emails, just literally no, no message. Just the name. No means no. You guys better put us on the map for this one. I don't know. So, and this was requested on Patreon by Slade, but it's not, it wasn't just multiple patrons requested. No means no. Yeah. People, have been dying for us to do this fucking episode. They're they're eating good. They got their oxbow last week. No means no this week. And it's a, plenty of good stuff in the future. In the future, I just know though these two bands are largely requested. Indeed. And uh no means no it, it's a on, to be fair, this is a band that I've referenced on the pod many times in the past, like many times. Yes. They're they're an easy citation band. They're hugely influential. They're like the only, in my knowledge, like the only true prog punk band that exists. Mm. Um, there's other bands that do proggy stuff and crazy stuff, but this band from the get-go was always like, ah, oh, we're just crazier and better in, in, in many ways. Uh, and I heard two albums before this episode, and they were in many years ago, my teenage years, um, two albums I had on rotation, and for some reason didn't go into the rest of them. Oh, shit. Uh, and now... That we listen to all their albums plus <laughs> a bunch of EPs. Uh, what does Alex think about them? I I love them. I love them. I'm glad you love them. Thank yeah. God. They're the, fucking, they're the fucking best, dude. That's so good. I'm exhausted, but exhausted. I love them. Yeah. This was a taxing discography lengthwise, but God damn, it was just delightful. Um, I'm so excited. I finally heard all the other albums. Um, maybe not all of them are, are super amazing. Maybe not, but many of them are. There's not, yeah, this is one of those discographies where, despite being pretty beefy, uh, there's not really a bad, bad album in here. Uh, I think there are a couple bum albums, maybe not the worst things ever, but okay. if you compare it to something else in the discography, it's like, fuck, that stinks. My uh, my opinions may change years from now. This is all new to me. Maybe, maybe. Uh, but it's funny, uh, my since I only heard two albums going in, my opinions on those are basically the same, mm-hmm. maybe slightly different. Um, but there were a couple of tough choices here, a couple of tough choices. Uh, I think I'm very satisfied with what I what I ended up with in the end. I I am not confident with my picks. No, I'm I'm gonna pick them, but yeah. By the end of it, I yeah. felt more because there's. Um, even though I've I've listened to two, I keep saying these two albums. You'll find out which ones. You probably know which fucking ones, but. I listened to them so much. It was it was hard to even have a new opinion on them. Yeah. I haven't heard them in a long time, but I listened to them so much. Uh, I finally, finally, as a seasoned old man, <laughs> like laid in concrete my actual like, all right, this is the kind of album I think this is. And I've separated it from my nostalgia and all this stuff. And I f- can finally look at it fairly. Yeah. Uh, but I'm also in love with these two brothers, Rob and John Wright, who are the two most talented musicians in all of punk it seems like i yeah i almost hesitate to even call them punk i mean i know they are yeah. and they have punk dna for sure but they're so all over the place it's just so hard to pigeonhole them like i was trying to think of the type of person i'd recommend this band to because they're not they're not so weird where it's like, oh, if you like like butthole surfers, yeah. you'll love this. But then they're not so cutting dry either. And it's just they've carved out this cool little corner for themselves. 
It's certainly unlike that. That's why I, I can only think of them as prog punk. It's, yeah. a, it's a subgenre that never really did it or existed, except I, I was considered um, the record by fear kind of prog punk just because just how wild it is and, and like technically amazing. But I can't think of that many examples. And this is like, it, it's just like prog rock, but instead of long keyboard solos and, you know, mid pace kind of a groovy rock you get the punky stuff mm -hmm. and you get the snarliness and the re really fast songs the really aggressive songs um it's they were hugely influential to like math rock and stuff which is very obvious and post hardcore which is even more obvious but it was still they're still more wild than post hardcore also i thought of a lot of like modern era melvins while listening to this yep. <laughs> a lot, I got a lot of Melvins in them as well. I, I wasn't was, expecting that. Yeah. I wasn't exp I was like, oh, the Melvins just kind of turned into no means. Yeah. No. <laughs> it, the, the three bands that, that kept popping up for me in this whole discography, uh, Melvins, Devo, and Dead Candies. Yes. Those three, yes. lots of influence. Not, not from, so much from the Melvins. That's just more of a coincidence, I think. Mm -hmm. But for Devo and DK, there is a huge... Huge influence on this band. I don't think it was an influence, but I'm going to throw in like B-52s as well. Oh, he does a lot of uh, vocal similarities with, between yeah. Rob and, and whoever that fucking goofy man is from the B-52s. Also, you go you go Devo and and Dead Kennedys. That's like wacky music, wacky vocals. Yep. I think the B-52s are kind of right at home with that. So Yeah, at least... In, yeah, they're pretty goofy. The thing is, they were more like like silly, goofy, dancey, poppy. Um, these guys never really. I mean, mm -hmm. they do they do silly, dancey, weird stuff. Yeah, but it's but always been weird. Not too many pop influences here. Not traditionally, no. There are poppy moments for sure, but not <clears throat> uh, not over, like a. I wouldn't say it's like a through line. Uh, so we have some notes here from our favorite boy, Tom Osmond, who should all go follow. He does our history. He gets albums for us. He gets interviews for us. He does a lot of work for us and he's very, very cool. He's a cool person. Go do that. Uh, but he pulled some, some, some snippets here from, uh, no means knows website, which is, Oh, I mean, it's fucking goofy. We'll talk about that more. Um, I'll, some stuff from alternative tentacles website. Uh, for those who don't know, Jello Biafra and Dead Kennedy's label, home label. I think, does does Jello still own it? Yes. Okay. Um, and then uh, an interview with with uh, drummer, vocalist John Wright from the Big Takeover in 2010. And uh, so the formative years, uh, they're brothers. And so I want to read some of the stuff that Tom pulled from the website because mm -hmm. it's fucking, it's just batshit. So... Tom says right here, he says, this info about the band is listed as the official biography, quote unquote, on their website. But the style is very tongue in cheek. Some of the content is clearly a joke. But hey, if they want to create such a wacky, semi apocryphal history, who am I to stand in their way? I'm including some of this for comedy, but if you want actual facts, it's probably safer to refer to the wiki page. That's the funny when you it's safer <laughs> to refer to the wiki page than their, the their official, own. Yeah. <laughs> because this is what their website says uh, the genesis of No Means No occurred in 1976 when brothers John and Rob Wright found themselves in attendance at a Ramones concert in Boulder, Colorado. The Father Wall was a lighting tech for a traveling musical troupe that happened to be sharing the stage with the up-and-coming New York Quartet. Though no one realized it until years later, future collaborator and co-conspirator Jello Biafra was also in attendance at that monumental event, as well as Ministries Al Jorgensen, a fellow named Rhino from Hygiene, Colorado, and the embattled Tommy B Bolin. I don't know what. Rob and John left that event, uh, ears ringing and ideas brewing. So... This is already like the most colorfully written goofy thing. I'm sure about half of that wasn't true. I'm sure Jello actually might have been there. Who knows? Um, maybe even Al Jorgensen. Tommy Boyle was a uh, guitarist who played with a group called Zephyr as well as the James Gang and Deep Purple. Oh, ah, okay. Okay. Well, that helps. I, I knew it sounded familiar. Ah, okay. Yeah. So they formed when... Uh, Rob, who was eight years older than, than John, which I thought was kind of a cute thing. It, it, somehow like endearing that he's that much older and they, it, they're still fr friends. Basically. Yeah. Um, he returned from, uh, college and, uh, I think he was 25 and they started playing in a band after seeing DOA perform at the university of Victoria. Apparently they got the name no means no from an anti-date rape slogan that was found on a graffiti wall. Uh, 
I'm not so sure why it's not why it's stylized with no spaces. Sometimes, sometimes it isn't. Sometimes it is. I like to think it's like uh, you ever hear like a, a New Yorker order a, a bacon, egg, and cheese. Well, no, they do it like like it's one word. Bacon and cheese. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I, no, so bacon, egg, and cheese. Yeah, bacon and cheese. <laughs> so they started like record recording on a Tascam four track recorder. I had I had me a fa- Tascam four track recorder. That's for damn sure. Um, they recorded a couple singles. I think there was there one of them was a split and. Uh, the very first thing ever was the Betrayal, Fear, Anger, and Hatred EP, which is, uh, I guess, came out in 1981. We'll be covering that as well. It's like tacked on to one of the reissues of their first album. Uh, but that's uh, the first thing they did, 1981. Uh, here's another snippet from their website. It says, refusing to give up on their dreams, Rob and John retired to the mum's basement and began recording songs as a two-piece at a dizzying rate. Their first release was a seven-inch called Look Here Come the Warmies, a song that incorporated heavy doses of hetero- heterophenomology in the extensive lyrics. Sadly, due to some flooding after a tropical cyclone, Few copies remain extant, and the master tapes were sold by the Wright's younger sister, Gwen. She is still asked to pay full price for admission to concerts. <laughs> so, I don't think that's exactly how it happened. Sure. <laughs> but they did record a bunch of shit in their, in their fucking basement. And uh, when we talk about it it, it, it sounds that way. So, they started out as a two-piece, and they, were, they performed as a two-piece. Just bass and drums, Rob on bass and vocals, John on drums. And I don't know when they started playing or when they started learning to play instruments, but they are fucking incredible, like, immediately. There um, is a point, maybe even early on, I've lost track of time, but Mm -hmm. um, John does not like quarter or eighth notes. He's 16th with pauses, and he does not like a standard boom bat beat. It's, It's always some fucking wild thing happening. Fucking in saying it must be exhausting doing a live set uh, i've only seen very little bit of their live footage and they look they fucking they're amazing they're just so damn he was is was i mean so he's one of the fucking best drummers most underrated drummers of all time yeah I mean, he's insanely good yeah I, he uh moved into my uh i would not want to try to fill in for mastodon and now no means no. Yep. Yeah, Braun Daler and fucking John Wright. I yeah, mean, that's he's the, on that level. I mean that's the holy trinity of uh can't do a normal beat and needs to constantly be moving. Who's the third? Oh sorry, I don't know. But oh, the, the holy duo. So, sorry. <laughs> I I I downed too much green tea before I got here. I understand. It's, yeah, it's, yeah. it's a very it's a very serious drink. Uh, we might as well ju- might as well start jumping into the albums. Uh, we have a whole lot to cover, and we're going to try and get through it without taking three and a half hours. Altogether, they have ten albums, but we'll be discussing uh, ten albums, uh, three EPs, and then several more EPs. But <laughs> only three EPs are going to get their own entry you know, introduction and whole conversation. The other EPs, we'll just kind of, we'll mention them, give them like, um, we listened to them, but we just didn't like, Mm -hmm. they're short. We're not gonna do a whole fucking thing on them. Um, So first EP came out in 1981. Last EP came out 2010. And oh boy, here's, here's the journey. You ready? I'm ready. Hell yeah. This is 1982's Mama. Make it a little bit. Just one. Maybe a couple more. This is a quieter introduction than I remember. But it is only bass and drums and, and piano. You had your dreams come true. Made I think for like a. There's no turn. I'm just going to use the term alternative band to record this in the 80s is... Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. In 81. I mean, or 82. It's punky. But, I mean, you got the goofy diva vocals. But the busiest fucking jazzy bass line with piano? Yeah. Like, if someone played this and you told me this was a new band, I'd be... I'd be convinced. I'd, I'd say, oh, okay, I can see why a band does that now, but 
82. Get out of here. I only believe it's 82 because it's right in front of me saying that. I yeah. can't fucking believe this is 82. And that's a... Uh, so cool. That's such a cool fucking bass line. Uh, it's Rob's really, really uh, characteristic as shit voice. He's got a very characteristic voice. Um, I'll, I, go, yeah, go ahead. I don't know if this is a hot take, but I'm just going to give it worst, least favorite. On, Are you out of your mind? Sorry, go on. On the, this on the grounds that I think they get better as songwriters as they go on. I do think so, but I think they take a very noticeable dip at a certain point. I, I think this is a fantastic entry point. Not entry point. Fantastic debut. Sorry. I think it's great, too. I just... Really? I, can, I, I consumed I, a lot right now. I will... And, Oh, good. Sorry. Another reason already. is uh, for a lot of the like, it's it's kind of the same vibe throughout, and other albums have that too. But definitely, uh, you boys overwhelmed is it's very daunting to get into. Uh huh. <laughs> and like I said, I don't think they have a bad album. I think they have some bad albums. Dude. Okay, <laughs> dude. There's I can name you three right now that are so much worse than this one. <laughs> <laughs> this is just getting it on the premise of I think they get way better as as songwriters. Hundred percent they do, but this is not even. Cl- I don't think this is even close to the worst. So this is a fucking awesome debut, so ahead of its fucking time, and it's kind of the only album in their whole discography that sounds like this because this is the only full length. Um, sorry, there's two full lengths with them as a duo, mm-hmm. and the other one. Is- I mean, not only does it sound nothing like this, but that one has way more overdubs. There's, there's like no guitar in this. It's just mm-hmm. bass and piano. Yeah, and it has a, a who? I mean, the, the I can't think of any any a single other punk band that did that. Uh, another, I can't think of a single other punk band that doesn't have a guitar. Yeah, probably. Yeah, probably no one. Um, also, I might again. I might be wrong, but I think this wins the award for like the most fucked up lyrics and the whole discography really there's some fucked up lyrics that are on oh oh they yeah i love the lyrics <laughs> don't get me wrong the fuck up lyrics continue yeah but it's just like every i was like every song huh oh my fucking god you guys are definitely young oh they yeah. were young they were yeah. yeah especially john was very young uh the song no sex yeah Oh, Jesus Christ. Like, that is fucking dark. Is it? What? What? Like, so I was, was, wasn't paying attention to the lyrics, so all I hear is full-on funk mm-hmm. uh, with a really fucking awesome chorus where he sounds like Mark Mosba from D-Lo. Yeah. And, then, and it has moments of Gang of Four in there. Uh, those fucking drums are incredible. Yeah. What is he saying? Oh, it sounds like some weird, incestuous thing where... Maybe a father is forcing his son to be a girl. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Like that's I an said, interesting, that's an interesting premise, though. Oh, it's <laughs> interesting. Do you want to go there? And these guys do. I love dark lyrics. Yeah. Ah, fuck it. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's fucking dark, but holy shit. It's, it's, I'm on board. It's not like a, a negative or a positive. I was just taken aback. I'm never to know what Mama's Little Boy is all about. Oh, that one was also kind of incestuous. You don't say. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. That one I was like, I don't I don't even want to try to dissect what is going on here. It kind of seems like a uh, a uh, boy who has a crush on his mom and is kind of a cuck and gets off on her uh. sleeping with m- men of his age. Yeah, it uh. was Man, these yeah. are some gnarly lyrics. Yeah. <laughs> That's fucking crazy. Good song though. <laughs> it's super jazzy. Uh what's it called? It's it, I I like that one as a pacer track. It's it's uh it's track four. Um, because before then you get just I don't know, it's so much wild. Every song is so fucking wild. Uh there's a lot of but a lot of groovy and funky on here. Yeah, oh for sure. And that continues for a long while the the groovy the funk stuff this is a little more like free flowing and not like free jazz the way uh, no no it's still very structured there's still a lot of it's still very much songs i do 
in terms of dark lyrics, I kind of do like the uh, my roommate is turning into a monster yeah. because usually when we think about abuse, it's like within the family or or lovers. And this one is a roommate being physically abusive to another roommate. And I'm like, you know what? I'm sure that happens all the time. And we just don't. Oh, totally. Why yeah. wouldn't it? Yeah. We just don't hear about it. Or it's not really spoken about. Yeah. yeah it's interesting. That is a cool song, though. That's like, um, that was when when I started really know. I mean, it's track two, but it's like, yeah, the, the lack, of, lack of guitar on this album is very hard to ignore. But there's, it's so tight. It just doesn't fucking matter. It kicks so much ass. Um, and John carries so much weight drumming. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know how Rob is making that sound on the intro to Red Devil, but it's fucking beautiful. It's like church bell bass. It's yeah, that one is appropriately a little more evil and sinister yeah. than others. Ton of range on that one. It's so far advanced beyond this year. It's insane. Um, that song also goes, it goes full tribal in a way that I can't really compare it to anyone else because mm -hmm. they do, they fuck with tribal beats a lot, but they, mm -hmm. again, John is just so fucking good. They're I, always interesting and different. Yeah. I just, I was like, I had my little practice pad out and I would like try to do some of these things. I'm just like, he does this. I don't think he gets tired. It, it seemed, yeah, yeah. It, it's the only explanation that yeah. just doesn't get tired. Uh, Rich Guns is super Devo sounding. I mean, we're going to get a lot of Devo comparisons, but um, as I think as the years go on, the Devo sound gets more and more egregious. Mm. <laughs> they become just Devo at a certain point. <laughs> it's like, Jesus Christ. Here it's just I, like, oh, they clearly like them. Yeah, I don't know about that. I never getting a little ahead i never felt like the electron there was never like I'm, a heavy no not like electronic but just the type of writing the type okay. of vocal the type the, the way the beats go to, like there's a very devo songwriting style devo would never never write uh about roommate abuse they would not write about <laughs> incestuous cuckolding as far as i know no uh, I don't love everything on here. I don't. I don't love No Rest for the Wicked so much. It's okay. It's fun, but it's it just didn't stick with me very much. Um, the closer, Living in Detente or Detente. I don't know how you pronounce that. Mm -hmm. uh, it's like bitter romantic jazz. It's piano driven with these really strange progressions, and even has a full synth solo. I fucking love it. I do like, yeah, songs like Approaching Zero, where it's like the more piano driven stuff. Well, approaching zero is where we get into the, oh, okay. the first EP. Okay. So um, might as well get into it. Um, on like a, one of the reissues of this album, they tack on the very first EP betrayal, fear, anger, hatred. Mm -hmm. um, and that one is a different vibe. It, yeah. That's like, it's them making songs like, Oh, let's make, let's do a bunch of overdubs. You do the four track. Let's make songs. Whereas Mama is like them, how they would perform. Yeah. Maybe without the piano, of course, but like it was clearly them trying to, Mama's like their own band. Mm -hmm. The first EP, Betrayal, Fear, Anger, Hatred is more like them just having fun. Yeah. That does make more sense because there's a little bit more rocking stuff going on there, whether it's like try not to stutter, which has a little peppering of like psycho billy stuff going on there. very yeah very twangy and southern it has like a cowpunk kind of feel to it maybe not a cowpunk beat exactly but just a feel yeah um i'm all white is like funk blues punk mm -hmm. um it's interesting but i don't i'm not i don't love it this is the wrong kind of sex funk y yeah we, no, <laughs> I, we all can't be blessed with tim buckley's prowess uh, and uh, approaching zero like you said that one is so strange i mean mm -hmm. it, it, so it's 50 style rock and roll p with piano and saxes. Um, it's just bizarre. It sounds that song in particular, nothing in, in the rest of these million albums and EPs will come even close to sounding like that. No, no, there's like some old time, like old timey music. Yeah. That's probably similar to ragtime, which is, <laughs> I like the song. What can I fucking say? And then forget your life, which closes that EP. Um, they will record it later best song in the EP for me. It's like weirdly mature compared to the other songs. It's dark as shit. It's borderline murdery with these, with this, um, that fuzz bass. Um, fuzz, I think it's a fuzz bass and guitar mm -hmm. at the same time. 
It, uh, is, it is absolutely like the the heaviest, sludgiest thing so far in their in their young career. Yeah, because they don't go super slow and sludgy that often. I mean, sometimes they do. Yeah, I don't know. They They're, do. They yeah. do. Yeah. I'm trying to think like how often, but it's it's kind of often. It's they, often enough. It's weird. They kind of do everything, but then it's at such a like dizzying pace that you don't really think about it. But not in a way where it's like garbage, like fast food music. No, that makes sense. You you come to accept them as they do a thing that can't be predicted. Mm -hmm. So whenever they do something that you would like, it's like if Ohm started playing fucking like two minute punk songs. Okay, you'd be like, what? Where? What the fuck is happening? But these guys have that range. Well, they'll do something like that, and then they'll 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 do it all. They'll do it literally 12 minute fucking just, sludge song or two minute punk song you just aren't shocked by it yeah because yeah. We've, you've you come to accept what they do yeah uh, and they do it so often that it, it just becomes it's all one thing they're they are div- they are varied and diverse all the way through mm-hmm. they don't have just have one thing um but the ep is I, it's cool it's fun but i think it's a little rough um, but I dig mama. I dig mama a lot. You think it's the worst and least favorite and your least favorite because they get better, but I think they do get better and then they get worse again. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Uh, I think that's fair. Yeah. Uh, so according to the very, very accurate, not at all joke website, this is what it says about this album. It says undaunted by the warmies failure to chart in Casey Kasem's hot 40, whatever the fuck that means. Uh, I guess he had national exposure. Um, like as a radio show, oh, and then, he? and then a little little bit of trivia six degrees away from random radio DJs. You are, huh? Who? Me, me, and I guess you. So there's also an LA DJ named LA Reed. Uh huh. And then my mom is friends with his son, uh uh-huh. David. That's how you get from Mike and Alex to Casey. Case them. Yeah. Well, there it is. We're related, guys. We're related. Yeah, that's what I was kidding. <laughs> uh, continuing. Uh, no Means No quickly released another single called Fear, Betrayal, Anger, and Hatred, opting to avoid Foyer Records strong armed, sorry, Foyer Records strong armed publishing rights tactics and release the album on their own Shuttle Rock Records label. Collectors and completists alike may recall some of the fine acts that came out on that grassroots label, DOA, April Wine, and the Grant Lawrence 3. Let me tell you, if you're a completionist for uh, physical media and you're like me and you're just getting into no means no, good luck. Good luck. I don't, unless you got some deep pockets, I couldn't really. Is that bad? It's, it's rough out. It's rough out here. I didn't, I didn't give a uh, a good look at at discogs yet but uh i was like oh i see their stuff is on their own record label maybe it's not streaming but maybe it's easy to buy yeah i know so we didn't mention this up top uh nothing is streaming not a single album is streaming streaming they have like a best of and some eps that are streaming but none of which that we're talking about today uh it is not the first episode that we've done where none of the albums are streaming but it is the first big beefy discography where nothing is streaming i would say one of the the biggest sins to like the other bands i was like okay i could see why this isn't streaming or so, i mean it's a little odd that they're not streaming but i guess i mean i i still don't get why that's not streaming but i well that's probably up there too but yeah this is another one where i'm like i don't i don't know this is nuts it's fucking nuts uh but back to more uh what appears to be fiction uh success immediately befell no means no who used the influx of capital to record their first full-length album mama a title of which mrs wright still disapproves she raised her boys better than mocking one's elders this is cute uh in the fallout over the, the naming of Mama, Mrs. Wright sold her house in order to buy a condo that lacked a basement, leaving John and Rob quite out of sorts and unable to record their dozens of would-be hit songs. During this time, the master tapes to Mama were lost, and this caused much consternation and dismay. The duo considered quitting music altogether, but a rather rabid fan from Alberta named Andy Kerr, um, ex One Horse Blue and uh, uh, Red Riders of the Dark Prairies, convinced the rhythm section to continue as a band, and that... 
well, is a huge development because Andy Kerr would be their first permanent guitarist, and he rules. Yes, he does. Well, everyone. Well, I'm going to assume most people in this band. Also, we've done so many. What was that little small band from Canada? I think they. Oh, were, the the smalls. The literally a. Sl- yeah, it's a little <laughs> small band. Wink, wink. They were from Alberta, right? Uh, I don't remember. They're from the middle of nowhere. Middle of nowhere. In Ca- I hope it was Alberta. I hope my memory's not that rough. Anyways. Uh, so we get, uh, after that, they recorded the You Kill Me EP, uh, which we will discuss with this next album. And I guess we might as well go into the next one. So here we go, baby. Their second full length album and their first with shit. Where's my notes? <laughs> their, uh, their first with Andy Kerr on guitar. This is 1986's Big Gap, by the way. Sex Mad. Also. First album on uh, Alternative Tentacles. Oh, that's right. I'll talk more about that in a minute. This oh, I love this song. Fucking man. rules. Absolutely. God damn, this fucking kid. Dude, it has so much character and so tight. Very snappy. Damn that fucking noise. Oh man. So that song that opener fucking absolutely rolls in. It's huge step up from the previous one in many ways. Um, this this was close to being a personal favorite. Uh, I, I never heard this one before, but I fucking love it. I could I it was in con, conten, contention. Contender? Yeah, yeah, that's the word I'm looking. I think for. it's the word. Yeah. Uh, so Andy Kerr's here, and I think it's the most endearing. F- fun cool like goofy little thing every album he's not credited every album <laughs> so on this album he's credited as no one in particular yeah and on every album it's the, S- the instruments different. are there but it's like it's, they refuse to give his name <laughs> his, his name is not on any of the albums um and i believe he sings a lot on this album yeah most of the time it's it's rob and after this album it's basically all rob and with backup vocals from the other members but there's a lot there's a lot of uh, Andy on this one. Like dad, I think was the first like hit quote unquote. Um, oh, that's, that's Andy on vocals. I like how I got so fatigued by these dark lyrics. I this, I didn't even try to write the description of what was going on there. It's just like it's brutal, stuff. brutal stuff. God damn. Uh, I love it though. It's, it's a uh, dad is just, you know, very snotty punk. It's super strict, uh, straightforward compared to the opener, but it still rules. I kind of see why that one was their, their, a semi hit mm-hmm. um obsessed fucking rules i mean I, it <sighs> dude. i love the blending of like punk and almost like danny elfman yeah like stuff and it has this cool dated sound to it that made me think of like sega genesis games oh uh, interesting yeah um i got from that i got devo and angel dust that's what oh, I, yeah. I got from that song um it's instrumental yeah um but it it is one of my favorite new songs that I've heard in recent memory. I fucking mm-hmm. love it so much. Uh, the big distinction with this album, um, there are several versions. You have the the version that we we got our hands on was the Sex Mad You Kill Me compilation. It has the You Kill Me EP attached on at the end of it. Um, but the track listings vary because you have the Canadian and UK side uh, UK version, and then the US version. If I'm picking. Hands down, easy, no fucking question. The Canadian and UK version is way, way better. I I could not tell you. Um, I had um, I listened to one, the first. So the version that we had is the the compilation, which is the US track listing, mm. and then so basically they swapped out two songs. Two songs aren't on the Canadian that are, are on the US, and vice versa. Okay. For the compilation, they they're all there, but the Canadian tracks are at the end of it, right before 
the the you kill me ep okay so it's basically here's the here's the uh the u.s version here are the two tracks you didn't get from the canadian version and here's the ep um i went and i was listening to the, as i was taking notes i was taking note of the ones that i liked and i was looking at the track listings and i was like no this i think the canadian version is better so i i fucking went in i rearranged it nice to listen to it that so much better so the the differences are uh no for, for new, it's no fucking but fucking is miss the letters are jumbled up um it's a 30 second punk song pretty much on on the u.s version it's acapella mm-hmm. for some reason and the, the canadian version it's a it's just a song yeah that's the, the, the first difference and then on the u.s version they have love thing following it as, as track five and on the canadian version they have instead of love thing they have hunt hunt the she beast uh, Hunt the She Beast is, I think, a significantly better song than Love Thing. I think it's a better pacer. It's better. It comes on better in the album. Um, the way No Fucking leads into it is perfect. It's clearly like they wrote it to to lead right into it. Yeah. Whereas the acapella No Fucking and Love Thing Love Thing have no like. There's no. It feels like oh, these were just kind of smushed together. They, they don't. Like, there's no flow to them. Yeah. And the last change is. The original UK, uh, UK and Canadian version ends with self pity, and the US version ends with revenge. I think revenge stinks, and I think self pity fucking rules. So it's a better closer too. Damn son, yeah. I uh, I like love thing and <laughs> I like love thing too. I just don't think it's as good as Hunt the She Beast. Yeah, um, revenge is like the most one of the most dead Kennedy sounding things. Really? Well, I felt um i like how nasty it gets around like the 250 mark mm. too so that's just me that stuff i like that all well, those parts what i don't like is the big giant rock horse that it keeps returning to over and over again mm. um that part doesn't do it for me and it takes up so much real estate in the song i will uh, say with the acapella version and no fucking yeah you don't get the misleading thing where you think you're gonna get some jazz punk and then it just pivots oh it does both of them both versions oh, have it okay yeah both i believe both versions have the little the, the little um right symbol yeah at the very beginning i think so uh and then you just get them screaming cocks and cunts <laughs> pretty much that's pretty much the song uh dead bob man jazzy prog punk it's f- abrasive as shit um it even reminds me of my war at times that's yeah. That's the first time I thought about math rock as well. Was Dead Bob? Yeah. Even uh, even though this is a good deal later, this is good four years after the first album. Uh, yeah. It feels that much more advanced, and it still feels way ahead of. This still feels insane for '86. Yeah, and then you gotta throw in a little little cream lick in there. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> they do a lot of uh. There's a lot of like little samples. Um. At various points, they'll just play a little riff of a song, a famous song. Um, Go, going back to, because uh, I just have my my notes in the, the bastardized order. Uh, I, I do love self-pity. That is... Fucking rips, man. I think you're right where that is significantly more creative and impressive. There's this, like, noisy buzzsaw spaceship sounding yeah section that's just like how how y'all doing that yeah yeah it's it, well i think it works significantly better as a closer it's also the longest song in here at seven and a half minutes by the way this band has some fucking long songs uh sometimes i mean there's like a, a a nice mix of like three four minute songs here uh but a couple on the six five minute range eventually they'll go into uh they don't go into double digit, digits too much but there's oftentimes eight seven, eight, nine minute songs. Mm -hmm. But I think, yeah, I think it's a fucking killer closer. Uh, Metronome. So damn great. Schizophrenic. It's catchy as shit. Um, Basically no guitar in there, but it works. Doesn't, doesn't matter. Also like how that song starts off slow and then gets fast. Like you would do with the metronome. Yeah, you would, you would, especially if you're practicing Um, long days, super busy jazz, jazzy bass lines with these extended dark, darker vocal lines, very hypnotic, um, pretty lengthy. Um, it's, it's, I mean, it's not super lengthy. It's only five minutes, but, um, I think it's, uh, quite hypnotic, um, and good arrangements too. I mean, these guys are pretty much beast set arrangements. I fucking love it. I fucking love the album so much. And then we get the, you kill me EP. 
And well, we got some stuff here. We got body bag, which boy, he does he not sound like Jello Biafra exactly <laughs> on that song? It's yeah, it is funny because he does like in his later years, he doesn't sound like Jello, and it's almost it's almost like Plankton from SpongeBob. Yeah, holy <laughs> shit. That's, ex- that's exactly what he sounds like. I couldn't unhear it. Dude, fuck. <laughs> I'm not, not going to be able to unhear it either. Yeah, he's plankton. Yeah. He's great, though. It's, great. it's amazing. It's very, yeah. He's got a lot of character to his voice. Yeah. Um, he doesn't sound like Jello so much later on, but he, I feel like he sings more like him later on. Mm. Here, he actually sounds like him. Yeah. Um, Stop It comes in real fast, kooky as shit. Uh, very cool, nutty main riff. Very chaotic. Just super great. Um, was it somebody's? Uh, I don't know, oddly catchy, but still, in, I mean, it's all they're, all the songs are fucking what they're insane sounding. Yeah, they all they all have these really paranoid, sick, twisted riffs. Um, they cover manic depression here, and it's pretty crazy as they should. Yeah, I like it. <laughs> I mean, it's not it's it's a it's not like a transformative cover, but it is a different cover. Like they are doing their own thing with it, hundred percent. Yeah, most of their cover songs rule. Yeah, I agree. I agree with that. Um, the EP closes out with Paradise. It's fast as hell with like a million voices on there. It gets super driving and basically ska in some areas. I don't love it, but it is fucking interesting as hell. It is uh, funny to follow up Manic Depress- Depression with a song that has all these different voices. That is true. Yeah, that is true. I guess it's more schizo, but still yeah. keeping in the no means no theme of mental illness. And fucked up lyrics. Yeah. Yeah, I dig the outro of that of that song too. Paradise, yeah, outro of Paradise fucking rules. But yeah, four years since the last album, but it feels like it. Like that's it's just like a huge evolution. Andy, I think, is a wonderful addition to round out their sound. Um, but the pianos are gone. Mm-hmm. Pianos are going to be gone for a while too. We are not getting pianos for a good minute. So here's some more nice, uh, probably fictional lore from the website. Uh, <laughs> It says, right in the success of the EP and its benevolent intentions, No Means No quickly returned to the studio for the tour de force Sex Mad. With its cover art reminiscent of Virgil Ross, Sex Mad's popularity helped the band embark on their first world tour, taking them through new territories such as Albania, Eastern Poland, <laughs> and Spartanburg, <laughs> South Carolina. That's... <laughs> Shot. All right, it's got me. <laughs> uh, it was then that media giant Jello Biafra, who had unknowingly crossed paths with the rights all those years ago, stepped into the picture, offering the band a multi-album recording contract, a tour bus named Bessie, and took them out to an IHOP to consummate the deal over a strawberry waffle topped with imitation dairy whip. And there it is. Sounds like a good deal. History was made. Yeah. yeah. So they're they're going to be on alternative tentacles for a good while. Good while. But we have a uh, another uh, couple year gap. And another album and another album that is going to be very different sounding. This next one is certainly not sounding like this one. So you ready? I'm ready. Hell yeah. This is 1988's Small Parts, Isolated and Destroyed. Ooh, crank that baby. Some of their album art looks kind of tacky or like sex man has a tacky cover for sure but there's something weird about this one i love it yeah it might be my favorite cover of theirs i just like i don't know something about it it's interesting it's very uh i don't know it's like it has like elements of a flag to it but are like it looks like a they use like a ballpoint pen to draw some things and then there's these very like solid it's an yeah. interesting cover also this song is nothing like anything off the last album with them before it it kind of had like a power metal in a way yeah it's cleaned up it's super melodic it feels like immaculate it's so <laughs> fine tuned But 
This might be one of my favorite drum albums. What an interesting beat. This this might be the start of I've given up on normal beats. Yeah. Oh man. So this album is another wild shift. This this might this might even be like dare I say one of the more like accessible el- like in a, in a way in a way personal favorite okay so this is one of the albums that i uh listened to religiously okay i heard this i mean i i've lost count of how many times i've heard this fucking thing hundreds i uh, mean not hundreds a hundred uh this is a big part of my my teenage years this is this is prog punk but not how they will they would do prog punk later or how they all they did it before. Like this is the only album that sounds like this. That's for damn sure. It's kind of similar to uh Bad Brains I against I it's uh, more complicated than that, but in a way it has a lot of le- that um big uh anthemic quality to it. I think I meant or like <clears throat> I against I and this album like creatively those are the only time the band goes to this one thing and then it's gone kind of yeah. the uh, quickness was close but it wasn't quite yeah uh, yeah this one i feel like z- no album has anything in common with this one this is a weird like outlier of a no means no album for one i'm not even explaining why there are uh there are eight songs they're all insanely long, most for the most part, and they are slow as shit. This is the slow album, which is the the My War. <laughs> it's basically the My War because, and kind of like My War, the 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 opener is really misleading. Yeah, because that was that wasn't slow. That was like mid pace, kind of rocking. Junk, which is probably my favorite No Means No song. Mm-hmm. Um, I think it's one of the best songs ever fucking written. Uh, one, of, I mean, I will. That's junk has been stuck in my head for maybe 15 years <laughs> that I was blown away by how seamlessly they blend all these different genres on that song as well as the, incredible. Yeah. Junk. Ha- I think it's one of the best songs ever written. Easily one of the best punk songs ever written because one, it's really pissed off and aggressive. It's in five, four, but it's, it's fast and aggressive. Um, these, it goes into these clean sections and they feel so unsettling. They're beautiful. They're mm-hmm. they're really hooky. They're super hooky. But there's a there's a weird sonic quality to the clean sections on that song that feel odd, especially around uh, two fifty. Um, oh, that's almost the end of the song. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it is two fifty when things get twisted mm-hmm. and he starts doing we're crawling, clawing, bluff oh, crawling. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, it gets like weirder and weirder, and it's the, it's clean, but it's there's something really fucked up about it. Um, and it's, yeah, it's this perfect hybrid of this insanely catchy, aggressive punk, uh, and then this fucked up, twisted, clean shit. Um, it's absolutely brilliant. Um, the, the reason I didn't give this best, um, cause it came close. The reason is be simply because of the one song and that sad doesn't do it for you. I like it. Um, but it always rubbed me the wrong way and I could never figure out why I finally understand <laughs> why it's too, it, uh, it disrupts the pacing up front. It's track three and it's not the, it's six and a half minutes, but it's not the longest song here, but it, I mean, it's slow as shit. It's fucking really moody. It's almost post rock. Mm-hmm. Um, it has these big, loud, angry sections, um, that alternate, but the vocals are very deep and creepy and they're layered. And, I was trying to pinpoint like, how, why is this one? Why is this song specifically disrupting the pacing for me? Uh, and I, all I did was just remove it from my brain because the after that you get the the title track, and it's seven seven minutes twenty seconds. Yet that would be would have been a perfect track three. I feel like mm. because it has this really um, anthemic, super punky main riff, but it's played slow and proggy. Um, that one along with uh, real love and victory. They're all big, super length. Like Real Love is 10 minutes long. Uh, Victory is eight minutes long. There were these big, giant, epic songs that have punk main riffs played slow and epic. Uh, it's just unlike anything I've heard. Do you think it's this, uh, a case of uh, being too similar? Uh, they are similar, but I don't think I'd say. I think Alan okay. Side is actually less similar. It's just 
too moody, too slow, not enough. Um, because you're following junk, which is like, man, that is one <laughs> wild fucking song. Um, and and that side I think is just too much of a downer. I, I feel I always felt like it bummed me out right when it came on, right early in the album. Yeah. And uh, the title track and Real Love. And, and and victory they're like really upbeat songs yeah they're big and long and slow but they're really cheerful they pro- they probably they probably aren't if you look at the lyrics <laughs> probably not <laughs> uh, was um victory they, they, the lyrically it was less ab- abrasive to me i'm sure there's still dark stuff in here but uh i wasn't like man you boys need to go to therapy probably yeah cuz i, I I've heard this a lot, so I the lyrics just sort of like got into my brain eventually. Uh, yeah, it never struck me as anything kind okay. of brutal. Okay, uh, could be wrong. Uh, victory, uh, super triumphant main riff, um, really spacey. I fuck. I mean, I fucking love it. I have problems with the vocals on this album. I think there's some really goofy, weird choices, but uh, it's. I mean, at this point, it's just completely grown on me. Yeah, this those big like epic prog rock songs really made me like I was in wow oh like they have really changed into totally different songwriters from the first album to now and I know they've taken a few breaks but it is a like crazy evolution you don't see a lot of bands do you you see a lot of two year breaks between albums but rarely do you hear a shift quite as jarring is this one or yeah or if a band does shift it can feel a little gimmicky or hokey like oh we do like country music now but it sounds half-hearted and this is just like they've just the songwriting gets better and you can't you can't describe that really or say hey we're we're there's no way to like put a a a term on it, I guess. Yeah. That that X factor. You could say you're a better songwriter, but yeah, but these guys are are doing really interest, interesting stuff. It's not just really wild and unique song structures and, and arrangements. It's like it's so hooky. It's so a victory. I mean, when man, that's a fucking powerful chorus. I mean, that that shit sticks in your head immediately. Um, super fun. And then re- real love is. I mean, it's just a punk song, but slowed down and played for 10 minutes. <laughs> it, it feels great. Uh, and again, like these are long songs, but they have like these journeys to them. They're not just, um, which they even do later on where they'll just kind of alternate between the same few parts and it goes on for a long time. These are like really in depth, like um, with the, the title track, it has this sort of formula. It'll, it'll do this one section and then it'll have this transition thing and it'll lead to this big, you know, um, rocking part. Um, the transitions will change every time they do it. Mm-hmm. So like the, the parts, the main parts will be the same, but how they get there is different. Um, there's a lot of shit like that on, on each of these songs that are um, totally unique. Uh, Teresa, give me that knife, which uh, is one of the few along with junk, like the speedy, crazy short songs. Yeah. Wild fucking crazy song. Um, Cow punk on speed, pretty much cool song. It wasn't one of my, it's not one of my favorite of their, like their fast songs, but it's strong. And it closes with the three and a half minute lonely, which is the quietest, cleanest thing in the album. Yeah, I thought that was one of the weaker songs. It's really? not it's not bad. I just I think I just went on this epic journey and that's just like like that's a good like f- fine normal song. It's normal. It's it's so, it's a soft landing of an album or a closer because you get real love before then. That's a big giant epic song. Um, the first two thirds of lonely, there's no drums at all. It's just, um, clean guitar, clean guitar and bass and vocals, but it's fun. I think it's well-written. I think it's a solid closer. Uh, but yeah, that's my favorite one. I, there are other things I, I probably wanted to give favorite to personal favorite as well, because they're newer and like, Oh, this fucking rules. I like, yeah, I want to hear this a bunch of times, but this is such a, I mean, I have such a fucking deep rooted love of this album. <laughs> I, this would have been best if I liked the uh, the pacing of it better. Uh, and Junk is one of the best fucking songs ever written. Uh, there's just so much on here that I love. Makes me feel good. It's a, it's a weird one. And there's no other punk album that sounds like it. 
Fuck no. I I was exposed to too much too much uh fine quality music here that I would I wish I had those like strong feelings. Oh yeah. Yeah, this is it's just this this is a rich meal if you're if you're new to No Means No. It's a yeah, these aren't short albums either. They're no. really beefy fucking albums. Uh but yes, my favorite, but we have plenty more to get to. Next we have um the EP that was recorded the same sessions mm-hmm. as Small Parts Isolated and Destroyed. Um, they just uh, had some extra. Well, actually, you know, before we move on, let's do a little bit of uh, where where are the I according to the, this website where are they at right now? Because uh, they they produced this uh, with a uh, Cecil English. He produced the small. Oh shit! There, there it is. It came up without me. For they probably were from Alberta. Yeah, maybe. Uh, they um, he's gonna produce all these albums up until like basically until Andy leaves, but. It says Joe's nephew Scott Henderson, who had emigrated to Victoria, uh, B. What the fuck, species stand for? British Columbia. There we go. I'm an idiot. And his youth offered to allow the band to set up shop in his home studio, the Rat's Nest, quote unquote. It was there that the band recorded demos and ultimately laid down hot tracks for small parts, isolated and destroyed. Fortunately, a mix up at Joe's label caused the LP to be compiled together with another band called No Means No from, uh, Ogala, Nebraska, <laughs> who had just submitted their own EP called The Day Everything Became Nothing. And then Tom notes, it should be quite clear that this is a joke. And it's indeed a joke uh, because that is also that is also the same <laughs> name as no, believe it or not. So that's, yeah. So they had some leftover stuff. Uh, and this EP was eventually compiled along with the small parts Isolated and Destroyed on a CD called The Day Everything Became Isolated and Destroyed. Uh, but we're doing it separately because... Fuck it. Fuck it. Whatever. So this is the same year, 1988. It's the day everything became nothing. This is like... Oh, they do... They kind of do like funk rock. Yeah. Yeah, at times. The dope peddling? Oh yeah. I think it's like the, one of the few, if not the only time in their whole career, double peddling. But maybe it just sounds like double peddling. He's probably using toms. The way like Dave Grohl does it. Yeah. Manic roars on vocals. It's kind of a thing that he'll he'll continue doing where he just sounds like a fucking ranting lunatic on vocals. Yeah. And then yeah, this absolutely should this be listened to. It's like one of the best companion pieces in music. I Oh, you think so? Like I I like the one two punch of of uh Sorry, these. Oh, I mean, I mean of the oh of the, of the uh, last album, this one. Yeah. Oh, okay, because um, I like it. I don't like it nearly as much as the album. But for one, it it's very obvious why they they put this out as an EP. It sounds nothing like it. It is. It's weird. It's different. But I don't. There is like this kingship I can feel throughout it. Well, yeah. There's a, there's a chemistry in there for sure. Um, recorded in the same time period. Uh, similar DNA, but not. Nothing like like there's no big epic songs here. Mm-hmm. Um, we have the the, the, the opener of the track, which is basically what you heard. Uh, pretty manic, but pretty fucking pretty rad. This is their like funk punk album in a way. Yeah, that's right. Um, because what else? It's uh, we got Beauty and the Beast, which is hideous and funky. Uh, yeah, it's this also like a cut above other whenever I hear like funk metal, it's always like very hit or miss. It's like bands do it very well. Or I'm like, this is cheesy and sounds kind of dated has like that eighties or early nineties. Yeah. I mean, these guys have a character of their their own entirely like beat of the beast doesn't sound like fucking anything I've heard. Um, it was, I mean, it's ugly as shit. Uh, it didn't, I didn't do it for me, but then on second listen, it won, it won me over. It's just too nutty and fun. 
Uh, they re-recorded Forget Your Life, and it fucking rules. It It's so much better than the original. I like, yeah, um, one of the sludgy songs. I like the, the like big operatic vocals on that. Yeah, it's big. It's bigger and more full than the original. I mean, the original was it was on um, their very first recording ever. Yeah, so it was makes sense. Yeah, this there was like yeah, you feel like the maturity in, in the performances here. Dead Souls is a full on furious hardcore punk song, very straightforward, but I dig it. Uh, and then you get the big old beefy boy of a closer. I mean, I. I hesitate to call it an epic, even though it's nine minutes, because it's a fucking weird song. I, I don't I'm not a fan of it. OK, it doesn't work for me, but it is. It, it's a weird call and response thing with drums, very military sounding. Um, it's kind of fucking annoying. <laughs> uh, a lot of the second half of it revolves around this kind of unchanging root note, but the arrangements are fucking going crazy. Um, gets kind of real experimental as it goes on. It, yeah, it does. Um, you know, you noted the military stuff, but it does kind of turn into like this almost like beatnik poetry yeah. thing a little bit when you get to what Slade says and then yeah. the guitar comes in and it gets more surreal and then it does kind of dip its toes into a more free jazz type vibe thing. Yeah, they don't do that that often, but they did here. Uh, and it- I didn't like mind it. I didn't mind it when it was on. It didn't like bother me, but it's just like, yeah, all right. I'm not too big of the dicking around, I guess. Talking about it with you, um, I do, I do wonder what jazz artists they like and probably do a Google search after this podcast because it's mm. like, yeah, you listen to beef and you're like, of course, of course he likes Ornette Coleman or you listen to, uh, Mad Lib, and you're like, of course, he likes Sun Ra, and it's mm-hmm. like it. It makes sense the jazz they listen to, but I feel like maybe the jazz artists they cite. I'm, I feel like that probably doesn't make any sense. Maybe. Well, I mean, we do. They, uh, obvious obviously, Miles Davis. Yeah, obvious. We'll, as we'll get to later, uh, but that's. I think it's par for the course. I mean, uh, he's like Bob Marley or Johnny Cash. It's like yeah, everyone. everyone. Say, yeah. Uh, uh, but yeah, it's it's still super fucking crazy. But in a way, it's surprise. I found it to be surprisingly different. It's like it's recorded in the same sessions, but it, it doesn't feel like those songs at all. No, it does make sense why it's its own EP. I think putting these on the EP is smarter. Yeah, I don't know. Don't know how I f- would feel about all this like funk stuff. With, I mean, I think this band could pull it off for sure yeah. if that was their intentions. Mm-hmm. But I think separating them, yeah, you just get you get your main course with the day, everything, yeah. and then you get your dessert. Oh, you mean like oh, with, uh, small, small parts, and then you, yeah, big long titles. Yes, uh, yeah, like that. That album definitely has. Um, has a personality to it. You feel the big rockingness to it, the big anth- anthemic riffs. It, I mean, that's like the most anthemic album they have, I think, mm-hmm. period. Uh, and this is far more of like, what, I guess what we can think of as No Means No, the crazy, proggy, wild, we're going to do some batshit crazy thing for a while. It's going to be fast and unpredictable. You know, depend. I don't know why my voice cracked. I'm <laughs> 36 years old. It shouldn't be. Um, I feel like to different people, this band probably means different things. Yeah. Yeah. Like you, you had the, your two albums. Yeah. And we're about to embark on their quote unquote popular. Era. Yeah, yeah. So it's just like, yeah, I, I bet it, the band means different things to different people. Very yeah. interesting in that aspect. Yeah. For me, it was small parts. I and destroyed. That's what they meant to me for, yeah. like, for a long time. And that's not at all like, <laughs> what they are. Uh, but good ass EP. Still, it's still fucking wild and crazy. It, it, significantly less accessible, I, I would say, but still pretty rad. Um, but now we're on to a big album, a popular album in their lifetime or, or life. We might as well get into it. Are you ready? I'm ready. Oh, boy. This is 1989's Wrong. You can lower the yeah, we oh, someone got better recording. <laughs> they sure did. <laughs> 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 
Getting chills, dude. Getting chills. Was, was this in the Tony? I feel like this was in a Tony Hawk game. I don't remember. Oh! You hear that sound? Cricket one. That these drums are fucking incredible. What a fucking amazing riff. Oh, it's... From something you have just want to punch someone in the face yep. after listening to this. Absolutely. Or during it. Yeah. Is it better to be lost or found? You gotta go. God damn. All right. All right. I gotta, I gotta, I gotta, I gotta pace myself. <laughs> okay. Okay. Best... Yeah, I was. I didn't want to give it best. I didn't know what this was considered the best. I didn't know that until like afterward. I was. Yeah, it took. I went back and forth through a lot of things. I was like, you know what? If this consistently slaps. It's too fucking consistent. It's yeah. so cons- This is the other album I had that I listened to. In an insane amount of times. And I always, I couldn't decide on, on the two, but I always had this weird love for small parts. Like I always felt like that was the one I liked more, but this one was just so undeniably consistent. And it was like, it had this um, consistent feel throughout the whole thing, even though each song has so much distinct character. Uh, and then I realized I learned later on like, doing this episode that this is widely considered the best. And it, it, it won the fucking Polaris heritage prize in 2021 or something, uh, whatever the fuck that is, but it's some music it's prize. Like Canadian. Yeah yeah, yeah. 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 And you know what? That's the way awards should be dealt out retro, like with hindsight. Yeah. Understanding the impact. Yeah. Don't, don't do it right. It's popular. No, no. You give awards to stuff that's 20 years old minimum. Yeah. <laughs> when the, the band is already broken up. Give uh, these people their accolades after the. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so this album uh, is pretty fucking incredible. So it's again, nothing like small parts. I said, destroyed. I mean, it is nothing like that. I mean, the opener was it indicator if that was an indicator enough i mean it's so this album is so fast yeah and then i read you know a few things john like attributed to them becoming popular and nirvana being one of those things oh yeah uh john right here says says there was that huge bubble of interest in alternative rock and the kind of venues that we were that we were playing right before nirvana broke we had a few successful tours of europe we impressed a lot of people so everybody was ready for that album from us there's one thing he says because they asked him like uh what do they think about you know this album be getting way more praise than every other album um and he says uh there's no resentment he said to call uh to call it our best album is not true from my perspective but who am i i just play on the damn thing i'm not the one buying the albums i find that's a uh-huh. what a charmingly humble way to look at that um i like that well john i tried i try not to but uh you know i tr- I'm, I, I'm a noob and- i tried not to also but <laughs> dude it's so good it's so consistent so it's not just consistent because they have they have a lot of consistent albums it's there's it's the consistency there's zero fat the pacing is fucking flawless like going from it's catching up uh the opener to the tower i mean that transition is fucking seamless the tower is a perfect follow-up it's driving and heavy um it's slower but it's not like slow it's not you know mm-hmm. small parts slow um it's a vicious fucking song rob's vocals on that song are i mean they he's shredding his vo- his voice doing it that was the first time i thought about the melvins oh yeah yeah i was like i could picture buzz singing this song ah there's a there's a couple songs on this album specifically that have been stuck in my head for 15 years uh tired of waiting which fuck there's something so satisfying about a song written like that it's so rhythmic it's uh the bass line is so jazzy and fast you can't you can't really make it out you can just kind of feel what it is Mm -hmm. and then the the verses are just they're so rhythmic it's it's so insanely catchy it almost taps into like a primal part of you 
It's a very primal album because I foolishly was like, is this ever going to let up? And that song came on. And I'm like, it's not going to let up. It's not going to let up. It's not going to let up. It's so good. The other song that has been stuck in my head for years is Rags and Bones. Uh, that main riff is so, I mean, it is like beautiful hard rock played by a dirty fucking bass super fast. You know, I initially I was like, I think this is one of my favorite no means no bass riffs, yeah. but I think it's just one of my favorite bass riffs ever. It's, now. Is it not amazing? It's, it's been stuck in my head for so many years. It's so fucking good. I, whenever I hear like punk bass riffs too i always think of that stupid i think it's like a no effects song i can't think of the song and it always sounded so like clunky and off to me and i never understood why people thought it was cool mm-hmm. i was like these no mean no no means no bass lines are like what that riff wants to be uh they are th- the bass on this album i mean this is a bass album but it's not a ba- it's not like um in mama where it's you know clean bass and drums and some piano. This is the dirtiest most powerful bass mm-hmm. to where there are songs uh th- there are songs in here that that don't have guitar on it that you don't even realize don't have guitar on it because of how dirty and, and and full everything sounds. There's still a lot of guitar on here, but uh I think a good example of that is stock taking. Oh yes. Yeah, just jazzy as fuck doing these like crazy vocal harmonies over noise. Yeah, insane to me. Um, th- and then, yeah, the drumming is just on a whole new level, too. It's it's the the most John assaults you with his drums throughout his discography, too, I think, because he yeah. gets he gets a little more like fancy, fancier as yeah. time goes on. But this is again keeping in theme with the opener like punch you in the face music oh absolutely it's so fast it's so just they never really lost energy up until the very end but this is the most i mean this is <laughs> this is intense uh the end of all things is a strange one i mean you don't see that coming um at that especially that early in the album it's six track six mm-hmm. it has a uh, guest uh female backup vocals but these those choruses they're like big giant pop almost like christian rock choruses it's funny you bring that up because there were times where i was like a less talented band this song would suck it would, it would fucking blow it, it would sound so cheesy but yeah. these guys are so good they could tap into these things that a b- normal band would just fuck up and it sound bad yeah, and they just they make you like it. I, I shouldn't like that. I should hate that chorus, but it's yeah. fucking great. That's great. I'm glad we have the same feel. Yeah, about that song. I mean, there's it's such an interesting album. Uh, Big Dick, which is fucking f- funny that's, and great. That, the greatest lyrics ever. <laughs> that's what the Red Hot Chili Peppers should sound like. <laughs> oh, <I'm, laughs> it is funky as hell, but it is it's gnarly, man. Um, that's a, that's one of the songs where you don't notice that there's no guitar because mm-hmm. of how you know jam-packed and, and full um full it feels it's funny you, m- you mentioned the, the chili peppers thing because rob does fucking scat chili peppers vocals on there there you go um, not my favorite thing in the world but he's charming and he's a weird cartoon character of a singer so it's fun don't get scammed by the alabama s- scammer what <laughs> no i this it's a joke chili peppers song oh, okay okay if okay. people are interested in the peppermen look up the peppermen yeah. All right, all right, all right. Uh, <laughs> two lips, two lungs, and one tongue is this cha- chaotic opening. Yeah, like the time signature of that one. It, it, so it's so fast and crazy that that it's almost distracting you from how fucking weird structurally it is. It's, and it's so short that it's over immediately. It's super weird. Anytime you pack that much chaos with twangy guitars, it's just why would you do this? I'm glad you did it, but why would you yeah, do it? Yeah, yeah. Um, oh no, Bruno. Oh no, Bruno. Uh, it's like the most straightforward punk song on this album. It's one of the most more straightforward punk songs you'll hear from them, period. It's so fucking catchy. It's already stuck in my head. Yeah. I just read the title and it's stuck in my head right now. Um, 
the song All Lies was the second time I thought about the Melvins, and I realized that they, on this album, like pinpointed that more like modern Melvin sound with the, the vocal harmonies, right? Yeah. Yeah. In 1989. <laughs> exactly. It's like, um, it's funny. Cause I, I put the, uh, it almost sounds like Beatles esque because of the vote, the types of vocal harmonies, yeah. which is where the Melvins get those vocal, like or like beach boys. Yeah. Beach boys, Beatles clearly. Uh, yeah. 89. And they were, these guys were so <laughs> fucking, they were just so advanced. It's, it's insane that like, uh, like they're respected and stuff, but the fact that they're not household names, I hate that term, but like the fact that everybody doesn't know like, oh yeah, they're that crazy fucking band that everybody copied. Yeah. I mean, it's not even that like everybody copied these guys. It's like everybody made genres to try and, and like b- get somewhere close to it. Post hardcore came from it. Math rock came from it. It's like these guys were before everything. It's just, it's just w- fucking weird. Getting ahead of it a little bit because I don't, I feel like I'd forget. Uh, state of Grace, this version rules. Oh, um, that so that's on the, the bonus tracks. The, oh, okay. Yeah, the, the oh, okay, that's what it is. Yeah, the, the album ends with All Eyes, that's the closer. Is it the same version that we'll hear later on or different? Um, of State of Grace, I know, I believe this is a different, different version. earlier version of State of Grace. Okay. Because they okay. do re- re-record this one. I forget which album it is, but they re-record that. Uh, the Worldhood. Oh, yeah. Of, say, yeah. yeah. Um, that's right. I just didn't want to forget about that because I knew it come, yeah. comes up again. Uh, so the bonus tracks here are Life in Hell, I Am Wrong, State of Grace, and End of the World. Uh, I believe some of those are, were released on an, another EP at some point in this thing. Sorry, I don't fucking remember. There's a million records and mm-hmm. little EPs. Um, but uh, life in hell is pretty fucking cool. Um, I dig that one a lot. I am wrong is a seven minute whopper. Um, uh, I'm not, it's, it's fine. I don't love it. I don't hate it. It's just sort of, it comes and goes. It's, it's big with, with like this big, um, poppy, uh, super poppy chorus. It does a lot of slow, fast, slow stuff, which eventually they start leading into that a lot. And I get, I get pretty tired of it. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm not too big on that one. State of grace. This isn't so that song isn't the first time I've thought of Danzig when hearing these guys, <laughs> but it definitely does remind me of Danzig. There are, there are moments where I'm just the, he's kind of singing like Danzig. Yeah, it's very it's it's a weird. I don't know. Weird overlap. State of Grace is by far the best bonus track. The other ones I was like, uh, I could I could take, I, yeah. I get why they're bonus tracks. I can go without End of the World as well. Um, it feels like it like an outtake. Uh, it's it's like a ballad with distorted bass and vocals, um, but yeah, State of Grace is, is pretty fucking good. Uh, yeah, this album. Sorry to give it best and be predictable, basic bitches, but it fucking really is. <laughs> I mean, gee, as much as I wanted to give it to small parts, as much as I wanted to, the flow and pacing and the consistency, it just it's just perfect. It's also you know very similar where. There's no other album like this is it. This is the the craziest and most hectic and unrelenting that they get angry. Yeah. yeah. Um yeah, it feels like a like a special little moment they, they captured on on wax there. Uh but both of our best as well as every everybody's best. I mean every fan, I guess. Uh what? Let's see if a different different best. Argue with us in the comments. If we're if we're still doing this in like like three years, I think we I think we gotta re- or do like a little bonus episode, and I should like revisit it. Uh oh, you mean like revisit past episodes? That's not a like this one in particular. There are some past actually, actually that's not a bad idea in general yeah. to revisit because there are some episodes where I don't agree with my picks. Then yeah, like, like, like yeah, a little bit of that's actually not bad. Um, you just gave us new ideas for content, uh, but time to move on. Yes, move on to the last album with Andy Kerr. I'm sad. I'm very sad because on Wrong, he's uh, credited as none of your fucking business, <laughs> which is the <laughs> Jesus Christ. I love it. I love it. Uh, but here we go, baby. This is 1991's zero plus two equals one. One, two, one. Which it doesn't, by the way. Once again, completely different direction. Yes. Every album. Also, I don't know. <laughs> Hold on. 
Now if I had the courage I'm gonna wait till the song's over It's so crazy It's like oh did you put on Like the violent femmes right now I, I, I love this song I think it's so fucking hooky It's fucking amazing It's also one of the like Only things I've heard going into it Oh really? Yeah Oh shit I didn't know that That's gotta be Andy on vocals Who's credited as just quotation marks Let's get started now Let's get started Doesn't come until a minute twenty, but I still want to get there. There it is. Fuck, dude. Oh, it's so satisfying. It sounds great. Yeah, I think you're right about the difference. And there can be no mystery. What is yet to come? Believe it or not, that song is five minutes long. <laughs> it doesn't sound like it should be that long, but it is. It goes by fast. Um, I'm going to give this personal favorite. I'm glad. I'm yeah. happy with that. This because uh, a friend of the podcast, Dylan, plays this album all the fucking time. Does he? So that's why it's this. It's great comfort food. Dude, I haven't. I've never heard this one before now. I was fucking over the goddamn moon. I fucking love it. Yeah. Uh also, I, yeah. real quick, go down uh, to related articles. Is that Mbop Hansen Brothers? No, no, no. <laughs> so they, they <laughs> Sorry. No, this is important because they had a side project called the Hansen Brothers okay. before Hansen. Okay. And the name was like a reference to uh, the characters from, from Slapshot. Okay. Uh, but Oh, okay. It, it was a side project with both John and Rob and then future guitarist Tom Halston. It's just a regular punk band. Yeah. They, they had like uh, a handful of albums. Okay. Four albums, yeah. And uh, yeah, that eventually would take up a lot of No Means Knows, knows, no means knows Time. Okay. The fucking Hanson Brothers. So this album, man, it's yet another complete stylistic shift. And yet another one that fucking works. I like every song in this album. Um, the it's, only only thing I have, only issue I have with it is that the songs are a bit fluffy and a bit padded out. Yeah, that's probably the first time that happens here. But mm. yeah, like the fall is angry Devo music. Yep, There's very these, Devo. Like stabby horns to it. Yep. Super uh, crazy Tom heavy intro too. Uh, title track is this more doomsday songs which they they seem to love you know oh yeah they're not writing about incest they're writing about the end of the world <laughs> one's a lot more true than the other oh, yeah what else i mean fucking the value of the blind i fucking love it so much i mean such great hooks wild song but insanely catchy uh more funk rock to mary yes uh on mary rather it's it's also crazy how groovy and funky they can be but mary's a good example where you don't you're not thinking about like groovy funk stuff no it just happens to be groovy and funky yeah um the the big takeaway i got from this album that kind of the 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 overarching personality of it whereas wrong was very proggy very fast very we're moving breakneck speed riff 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 this one hangs on one riff for a while and kind of develops on it um the arrangements kind of move around that one foundational riff this is this in a way this is <laughs> this is no means no doing pop music kind of because yeah these are very you can grab onto these you like it's one riff and you, it will look, repeat enough to where you kind of like okay i get what the song is this the drums are still going fucking crazy and everything is still pretty wild but dude you can grab onto it joyful reunion those drums like kick you in the chest like a fucking mule I, yes they do i love them so much love it um the song is on the on the lighter side um still loud and aggressive but you know lighter in mood mm -hmm. hence i guess joyful reunion is a very light title uh i mean the, the also not just that song but the tom sound fucking amazing on the whole album it's got a great tom sound it does um yeah nothing to do with the drums but i think my favorite track on here this because it's so fucking 
weird and in some ways has no business being on this album every day i start to ooze oh it is fucking weird there's like a a ymo part in the middle of this song oh yes that's right and it works it works it does it goes full sky new wave with these super bright synths it's pretty fucking awesome it's one of the most like bonkers things they've done that that crazy ymo section turned the whole song around for me i was like oh yeah. it's kind of annoying no and then i was that, like fuck yes dude fuck yes that happens on a few songs mm -hmm. in their later years not that we're there quite yet but there there are a few songs later on where i'm just like you know i don't care for this and then they do something and i'm like you know what that's yeah, fucking cool i do care uh where, where is it um um i i didn't get a timestamp because i had to listen to this on youtube but uh when putting it all in order ain't enough uh around like a little past the halfway mark there is this crazy fucking riff where i can't even tell what's happening like i can't figure out what they're doing or how they're making the mm. sounds but it just feels nice yeah it, they do that every once in a while they'll just make this collage of sounds don't know what notes they're doing or how they're doing or which if, which uh if that's what note the guitar is playing what note is the bass bass is playing but it all just kind of meshes together into this weird thing beautiful stuff uh the night everything became nothing First of all, I like it a lot. It's very fucking rad. But come on, it's just Winona's Big Brown Beaver from Primus. That's another band you think of. Well, you're like, God damn, there's Primus stuff in here yeah, too. Yeah, there definitely is. Um, it's an instrumental one, by the way. Yeah, those quick, like, two minute songs. Yeah. Just, they did kind of this, like, blend together for me, though. I would say that's my my nitpick criticism about this yeah we're putting it all together when putting it all in order enough the night nothing became everything and i think you know all three of those are under three minutes and they're all back to back yeah uh but then the, it's followed by the eight minute ghosts which i fucking love god i mean well here's the thing i i am a little conflicted with it because it goes into this very driving four four and it feels amazing mm -hmm. um but like a lot of it kind of goes fucking wild and it, 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 it kind of loses me. Um, definitely doesn't leave a super lasting impression, but the parts that rule rule so fucking hard that that's all I end up remembering, even though all eight minutes, there's a lot of that eight minutes I'm not into. Yeah. But the parts that rule fucking absolutely rule. I would, I guess I would say it is one of their, their weaker epic songs. If yeah. you want to call them that. I still like it because the parts that I like kind of scratch enough of the itch. But um, yeah, there's, there's you know what? some padding there. A bad no means no song is still better than a lot of people's OK songs. A lot of bands. A lot of bands are a lot worse than this band. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I mean, it's they stepped away from the super complex prog uh, and they're focusing on less riffs. But yeah. Uh, the simplicity it makes it easier to hold on to. It's a little bit more accessible. Um, I think it, it can it can drag on when it doesn't hit as hard, but when it fucking lands, yeah, man, it's this album rules too. Uh, Alex's personal favorite, and we still got some more. Oh boy, you ready? Yep, we're moving. We're moving now. Oh, we're moving. So we uh, we don't have uh andy anymore is this next album is their first time being a duo since mama and i believe their last time being a duo mm -hmm. so this is 1993's why do they call me mr happy <laughs> piano's back piano's back Very, very yes, like. Yeah, yeah. Yet another completely different direction. I mean, you can tell it's no means no, but it's the pianos are back. It, it feels fucking way different. There are those who are silent, yet who talk all of the time. Their faces never really show the way that quiet footsteps go. And when I greet them, yeah, this I makes me think of post punk in an end. Like it ends in late 70s punk. But with piano. And if you want to touch, just open up your mouth and speak. What is 
Sleka. Like minimal Emerson, Lake, and Palmer. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, look, there's uh, Craig Bougie or whatever. Oh, it's Craig. It's a Craig Bougie. So that is a neat opener. Um, but this is where I felt things taking a dip. Still a good album. But this one, I had some problems with this one. Yeah, it's a little off. Also, you know, I was just kind of mainlining these albums, not yeah. checking. Uh, oh, yeah, you got the wrong track listing. I got the wrong track order, but it, I don't feel like that hampered my enjoyment of the album. Mm. Uh I may feel differently about it, but sequencing changes a whole lot. Yeah, yeah I was uh, super nervous about uh, missing songs, so I kept checking it. Oh yeah, checking. yeah. So I ended up listening to some stuff on on YouTube, um, and then checking that. It was a it was a pain in the ass. But it, listening to this band is a pain in the ass, dude. It, it's not easy to get these fucking albums. But uh, you know what? I li- I listened to all of it, just not. <laughs> just did, he did hear it. He yeah. did hear it. Uh, so the follow up to Land of the Living. So I mean, first of all, that that song. Um, the only thing that gives it away that Andy's not here is that oh, you hear piano and the bass is a little more prominent. A little bit, but it's not like punchy and distorted. It's just it's just a big bass. Um, but even then it's like, there's a bunch of overdubs. So you don't really feel like it's a duo at all. Mm-hmm. Um, you don't really know it. you you feel something different, but you don't feel that there's no guitar. Um, and there, there were three songs on here that were co-written by Andy, which are, uh, happy bridge. I need you and cat sex and Nazis. Um, I the closer love happy bridge so much. I wish that was like a full length song. Dude, it's fantastic. It's a minute and it's less than a minute and a half. It's a transition song. It's instrumental. It's fucking awesome. I love how weird and it is. It is microwave punk music. Yeah. <laughs> or sorry, prog music. Microwave prog. Yeah. It, it's fucking wonderful. It's a, uh, I don't know. It's happy and energetic, but it's just fucking well done. Uh, I think so. I did have a lot of problems with this, especially the pacing. Uh, but I have to give it up to slowly melting, which I think is an all time favorite. No one's no song. It uh, is. I fucking love it so much. Yeah. I love the like Pee Wee Herman, Danny Elfman stuff going yeah. on there. Yep. Uh, I, I appreciate that. It's, it's weird like that, but it's still going to get heavy and noisy. It does. And the, the piano layers, are such an integral part of the riff. Mm-hmm. It ha- it's just a beautiful harmony with the the way that uh, the piano is mixing with everything else. Um, God damn it! And then it loses its shit halfway through. Completely loses its shit. Um, ends with like free jazz, pretty much. But I mean, it's fucking beautiful and, and catchy as hell. Uh, let's see, I yeah, my problems with this are like a lot of the pacing because these are long fucking songs. Yeah, uh, yeah. one of those being machine which. Yep. I like, but I this maybe one of the first times where I'm like, it could be a little shorter. I don't, I like Machine. It's a very strange song. I don't, I don't like love it because I love the intro and the, but the main riff comes in with the drums. It doesn't, I don't like, I'm not like too crazy about that riff. Um, <clears throat> but it has some really good moments and it's just fucking weird and it sounds nothing like they've ever done before. And the fact that there's still this unexpected and creative it's like i just i enjoy it i just like the parts that i like i like and it's just such a weird song uh what didn't work for me is the river which is track two and immediately put a halt on the pacing of this album for me the opening riff sounds it's just it sounds so much like rumble Mm. and then uh that's that's funny that you say that because a song later on i felt i felt that way I'm sure it's not uncalled for for in the, in that example as well. Uh, I find these riffs to be like the first time that it just, it just seem just not that interesting. They're just like it's played interesting, but the actual writing, the actual riffs themselves aren't interesting to me. And it's also you know six minutes, and I feel like that's a kind of draggy for what the song mm. is doing. Uh, and then following Machine, you get Madness and Death, 
which opens with these hideous bass chords and goes fucking mad funky and proggy. Uh, it might be one of the funkiest songs ever. One of their funkiest songs ever. Yeah. And then I was like, you know what, guys? It is hard enough just being alive. I feel I feel that. Is that what? <laughs> it, wait, what? Oh, they do sing. It's it's hard enough oh, just being alive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I fucking blanked on that. Um, so one of the, the biggest song here, longest song here, is you got Kill Everyone Now. And it's a doozy. Uh, I don't really like it. I do like how fucking insane Rob is on there. He's insane on there. I think. That's one of those songs where the longer it goes on, it progressively gets more and more deranged. And yeah, yes, just screaming out like one billion, two billion mm. over noise. Yeah. is amazing. It's fun. So with the big songs that end up not working for me, what p- turns me around is like the fucking he's just in complete maniacal rambling vocals. Mm-hmm. Uh, but there's this main uh, recurring big rock riff and I fucking just not, I just don't not like it. You. And it's so much of the song kind of revolves around that. Um, There's like a, a weird smattering of cover or samples throughout this album too. Sure is. Lullaby is dancing in the street. Yep. And uh, I can't say it's bad, but I don't like it very much. You know, I don't think I've ever liked that. It's not that great. I like the Van Halen version because it's fun. And yeah. You know, Daily Roth is the man. <laughs> but talk about crazy vocals. Talk about crazy vocals. Uh, but that's the only version I'll kind of accept just because I don't <laughs> like the song. Uh, but then you get uh, Cat, Sex, and Nazis, and they they play, they play it opens up with just We Care A Lot from Faith No More. Yeah, which is... <laughs> fucking... It's like that was released a couple of years before this. <laughs> Imagine like putting on like a Mastodon album and they open up with like a a Baroness a song. Thing, thing, yeah, that it's came exactly out like, the few like <laughs> it's exactly like that. It's a, you, more bands sample your 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 peers sample your peers around the same time period. It's so Just strange. Make it confusing. Yeah, uh, someone did that. Uh, who did that? It was a Tom Waits song. Who who it was? Uh, Tim Buckley, wasn't it? Probably. Tim Buckley who covered a Tom Waits song that was released like a couple years or like the same year. Oh, okay. I think anyway. Um, but yeah, that song is another, it's another eight minute whopper and it has some legitimately strong riffs on there and it's fucking super weird. Um, I think it overstays its welcome quite a bit, but the, I love the course so much that it just ended up softening, softening me up in the end. It's definitely one of the few times where, uh, you know, there. Th- it's always about horrible things, but the music is like genuinely fun and. Well, se- I like cats and sex. The Nazis part's kind of the sad part. Yeah, I mean, if you're into cats and Nazis, you're not having sex. So I don't know on what planet. <laughs> That's pretty good. <laughs> we're all three of these. Not bad. Not bad at all. Uh, yeah, I, I'd say this is a noticeable step down, um, but it's not not a bad album at all. Um, Andy's gone, but the, the the insanity is not. Uh, they're they're kind of leaning into the 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 style of the last album with the the simpler, simpler, not simple. I guess simpler songs. It's just less riffs, less riffs. Um, uh, still complicated structures, less riffs, but now they're back to long songs. Okay. Um, yeah, I still uh, like quite a bit on here, but flawed as a whole i'd say doesn't stick to your ribs the way other albums no no except slowly melting which i fucking love yeah i definitely love that one but time to move on are you ready i'm ready hell yeah this is 1995's the worldhood of the world as such this is, uh, Duh! Yeah. Duh! Oh, <laughs> fucking jelly opera again <laughs> <laughs> it's just, it's just Jello. <laughs> By the way, they put out an album with Jello Biafra bef- uh, before zero plus two plus one uh, equals one. So oh yeah, they did a collab album with Jello. Oh, fuck this rules. So. Jello. 
So that's new guitar guitar player Tom Holliston. This is like also the happiest thing. It's pretty happy. I mean, this is like a super happy riff, but it, it, it's an upbeat. It is. This is super happy, but it's just fucking. It's really deep. It's such an interestingly written riff. Um, having said that, I think this album is one of their worst ones. Uh, Interesting. Yeah, I love that opener so much, and then it, it leads beautifully into humans, which I like a lot too. But it's just. Devo. It's just <laughs> fucking Devo, man. I love Devo, which is why I like it. But uh, it is a bit straightforward in that end. And there are songs in here that I do like a lot. But over the course of 51 minutes, there's a lot on here that I don't like that much. I think I like a good amount on here. All right. Explain. Tell me. Um, He learned how to bleed. Uh-huh. I can hear like uh, a band like torch oh. how i'm going to assume they listen to no means no and kind mm -hmm. of borrowed some of their sound from there mm -hmm. um and then yeah i around like my politics i was like i feel like this album has a very like not overtly memorable sound yeah but they were definitely going for something here. Yeah. I that stuff in them just not landing for me. Even though like my politics is like a big kind of memorable type of song, yeah. I don't find it to be memorable. You know why? There's just not enough porn guitar. They, I was they, they, there's they, only one tiny little section of porn guitar. There's not enough on not that. enough. Uh I find I find the, the riffs on them to be pretty awful generic punk and like and it's separated by these these mean heavier sections which i do like i like mm -hmm. those sections a lot but uh it just leans on like the 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 we kind of punk stuff quite a bit and then it even goes into this fucking annoying reggae arrangement of that main riff uh and that's already okay i already didn't like the riff now you're playing it like reggae <laughs> and you're like ah it's like i get what they're what they're doing just it's just none of it landed for me um, I've got a gun has a lot of circle jerks in it. It really reminds me of them. That was the song where I was like, this feels like straightforward punk it to is. me. But, sure is. You know, two, two minutes, 26 seconds. No harm, no foul. It comes and goes. The, the times you've dabbled with straightforward punk in the past were just so cool, though. Yeah. That like, oh, it's like circle jerks, but not quite as cool. Um, they, although, uh, you know, it's, I do like this more than circle jerks. Everything. <laughs> The first album is great. The second album is good. The rest I can kind of... All right. But we're not talking about Circle Jerks. No, we're not. Lost is my favorite song on here. That is a very fucking cool one. Fascinating it's, one. It's messy and all over the place. Definitely nails a, a vibe of feeling lost. But, you know, these guys are, are so tight in, yep. in the pocket that they aren't... Such a twisted main rev. Um, again, it has a lot of Devo on it. These new wavy, dancey verses... Uh, super fun. I dig a lot. Uh, you got, man, Predators is a weird one. I like those surreal backup vocals. Yeah, I think they're female. They sound female. They probably... Or they're angels. Or they're angels. They're, they're probably they're, angels. They're probably just <laughs> angels or keyboards. Because I don't think they're actual women. But kooky, complicated weirdness. Uh, and there's this one... It happens, I think, twice in the song, but there's one fucking incredible vocal harmony section that, that that's on there that it's just so musical. It's so like beautifully musical. Yeah. Uh, in in a band where like yeah they they do dabble with like super melodic stuff, but overall it's quite aggressive and kooky and strange. And then you get just one gorgeous moment like that or two, whatever. Um, Wiggly Worm is more Devo, which is a little bit of a coincidence, maybe, because Devo has a song called Wiggly World <laughs> uh, on the second album. I'm all for the video game music, uh, and I don't feel like they really ever lean into electronics too hard, except for, you know, maybe two songs. So mm -hmm. I was for it. I. Uh, it's it's basically you're right. It's basically video game music. It's fun and well. It's not my favorite thing ever, but it's it's fun. Uh, Tuck it away is another completely average punk song. I uh, I was gonna say about that song, much how uh, you compared that previous song on a different album to like 
it could be like cheesy Christian rock. Yeah. And, yeah, the end of all things, yeah. In a shitty in a shitty band, Tuck It Away is a pop punk song. Yeah. Yeah. They do dab with pop punk later on. Oh boy, we'll get there. Just a little not uh, yeah, I think a little. <laughs> uh you got Victim's Choice, which is the I think Victim's Choice is the the most dead candies copycat song they have. I I wish there was more shredding on that song. It's only three minutes, but there's this little shred part uh-huh. that I enjoy very much. And then it's just kind of taken away. I was like, can you just the whole song? Yeah. They, that may be a little excessive, but you know. maybe, maybe uh, it's, it's so the song, like that song, I mean, I feel like it has like no rhyme or reason. There's a lot of like randomness on, on these songs, uh, randomness and, and, just derivative of Devo and Dick Hannies a lot of the time, which is weird, but um, it, it won me over on second lesson. Rhythm's choice. It's just fun. It's fucking batshit crazy. Uh, this is where state of grace is the re-recorded. I think I like the original version better. Mm-hmm. I think I do as well. Yeah. Uh, the jungle. How do you feel about the jungle? The closer. I love the bass son. It's fun. It's fun. <laughs> it's Maybe doesn't need to be near seven minutes long. No, it doesn't. It's so long. But that bass rules so much. Maybe I want to hear it for seven minutes. It's such a fun. Uh, oh. It's so like, uh, and it's a corny song about jungle and it has like the tribal drums and the vocals are like Georgia the Jungle type fucking what, uh, what would you compare it, that to? Yeah, I guess it's like rap, rap, like fun rapping style kind of thing. I don't know. It's goofy and oh, silly. Rappers to like Congo drums. Yeah, uh, but it's it's like a it's fun. Uh, it's not my favorite thing ever. And uh, but it's something again. It's something they've never done before. It's something that kind of goofy and silly and actually catchy. Um, but yeah. I had to go back to this one because I was like concerned. Like, do I think this is the worst? And I went back and like not not with stuff like lost on it, uh, or even like the the opening two tracks, and even victims' choice. It's like you no, know, it's it's fine. It's not great. It's the albums are getting rougher, but it's not the worst. Mm-hmm. Um, it has some moments. Uh, on this album, this is the only album that has Ken Kempster on drums. He does. Uh, what a, what a name. I know Ken Kempster. <laughs> sounds, yeah, it does sound like a made up name. Uh, he goes on to tour with them a lot. Uh, he's like I, one of their boys. Again, fucking doing two two drums before the melt. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, I don't know how many how often they did two drums at the same time, or how much of it was like trading off. Okay, maybe like John jumping on keyboard. Yeah, or something. Okay, because I believe he toured with them. Uh, at some point, maybe now or in the future, but this is the only album that he's he's on, but he would be around um, peripherally. And then, yeah, we got Tom Holliston uh, on guitar now, and he will be here until the end. And yeah, he's fine. He's cool. I don't love him the way I love Andy just because of the character and just the songs, the way they, they came together with Andy. Um, but he fits in. He's fine. Uh but yeah, I guess that's it for that. Now we have a couple more. Now we have, I guess, what's considered their difficult album? Or this, difficult experimental album? I, I don't know. I, I, I feel like we started off difficult and experimental. I yeah, I yeah, pretty much. Uh by the way, I didn't I didn't even mention um Andy left because he migrated to the Netherlands. Oh shit. He was like, ah, good for him. Holy shit. And I believe he started some some projects out there. I think he has like a duo. Yeah, he right now he's he's a uh, he's with he's in two pin den. It's a g- guitar duo, but yeah, it seems like he just yeah I'm, I'm moving here. Good luck, and so he finished off the tour for zero plus two equals one, and then that was that. But yeah, now we got we got Tom full time. We had Kempster for a little bit, but now moving on to 1998's Dance of the Headless Bourgeoisie. got to be some of the like grooviest math rock stuff yeah it is very mathy i don't love this intro at all but 
It is pretty fucking groovy. He pushed her in the alley. And he tried to lay her low. His vocals are getting progressively more and more like theatrical and goofy. Oh, yeah. We're moving into Plankton territory yeah. now. Yeah. She said, I know a little story. And this story must be told. But it's not as We never heard about it. Also kind of like buzz. Yeah. yeah. The older it gets, the deeper it gets, and the more like buzzy sounds. I can't believe the song is almost six minutes long, but at three and a half minutes, it takes a fucking turn, gets super tribal, it speeds up, gets real chaotic. Outro is pretty pretty intense for where we. S- yeah, 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 it's very different. Um, I think that's one of their weakest openers. Uh, not not super big on that song, not super big on this album actually. But yeah, um, I don't hate it, but I definitely think it's one of the uh, on the weaker side. It is. I mean, they're a real interesting band, but this is it's interesting in a different way. Where you hear like the other ones, maybe the complexities, yeah, and you're just like, it's like that movie Spring Breakers. <laughs> <laughs> I that, don't know what else to compare it to, dude. It's almost like it's almost like because that movie, it's funny and interesting and, and entertaining on the surface, but you watch it, <laughs> it stinks. There's like something off. It's something, yeah. It's often it's shitty. But I enjoy it. <laughs> I you go enjoy it for the wrong reasons. That's kind of like this. Uh, so this was in contention for worse for me. Oh man! But what took it out is the entire middle section, starting from the title track um, and ending with "Give Me the Push." That whole middle chunk, I think, is actually pretty solid. It's pretty wild for sure. Hundred percent. So the title track. Uh, it starts out like standard no means no, you know, the fucking crazy fast bass lines, maniacal mm-hmm. rambling, awesome drums. Um, and it's it's eight minutes, but like, there, I don't know, it's it's, a, it, it's the more, one of the more interesting things on that first chunk because it, that first chunk is pretty fucking rough, I think. I mean, like you got like going nowhere, which is this, it's a lot of 60s in that. It's, it kind of sounds to me like, uh, reminds, reminds me of uh, early move. Mm-hmm. It's like the move combined with 90s punk. Um, I think it's interesting, but I don't really enjoy it. I'm an asshole. Uh, it's just a ridiculous fucking sea shanty song with a cow punk chorus. I'm going to guess you don't like the band Pennywise. I never, not particularly. Does thought, it sound like Pennywise? I kind of thought about Penny or maybe like that, that like, I don't know if I'm using it like oi punk. Oh, I'm not a fan of very either. like anthem. Themic yeah. sing along punk. Yeah, yeah, I know what you're saying. Yeah, but it's not never been my bag. Um, as much as I love the intro to disappear, the song quickly becomes kind of odd and kooky with hints of you know old timey rock and roll, fifties like rock and roll. They have a weird throat singing part in that song. Do they? I don't so, think I caught it. Yeah, anytime you do like the. Uh, yeah, yours is better. <laughs> I find that song to be super fucking corny, though. I can't, it is. I can't it stand is. it. Yeah. Uh, so that's why when, when the title track comes on, it sounds like what we know of what we what we come to expect from No Means No. But in this context, like, oh, thank God, at least it's like fucking crazy again. And something like that that can kind of perk me up because the rest of that shit was just like, let's try this silly thing. Let's try this silly thing. And it's just kind of annoying to me. Uh, and then. Favorite song on the album by far, no fucking contest. The world wasn't built in a day. That is the meanest, nastiest, sluggiest. Well, there's another mean song on here, but yes, yeah. that sonically. So fucking cool. I love those vocal lines. Like legitimately love those vocal lines. Um it's like sultry and dark and in almost Danzig kind of way. Another yeah. song that kind of reminds me of Danzig. Also, this isn't the first time it's uh it's gonna remind me of this. Or this isn't the last time, rather. It's going to remind me of this. Uh, Rob's voice, when he starts doing this speak storytelling, speak singing thing uh, where it gets really gravelly, fucking sounds like Nick Cave. Oh, yeah, yeah. That's another artist I thought of. There were times where I was like, I could I could hear Nick Cave. 100%. It's like, like uh, 
Like stagger Lee, Nick Cave. Stop. It gets really gravelly and Stop deep. Stop taking all my like shit really? and album before. <laughs> you got that? <laughs> shit, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder if we noted that because I didn't note it on this album, Stagger Lee. I, I did write on a different album later on. It's on the well, next album. I'll get maybe. Yeah. Maybe it might be the same song. Well, but it's probably the same song. Yeah, maybe. Uh, but I fucking love the song. It's uh, nine and a half minutes that I am fine with. It's, it's great. Feels great. It's great. Um, it's so weird though. Although, I kind of get it. <laughs> Putting I can't stop talking between the world and the rape because the songs are heavy and oh, mean. Yeah. <laughs> and then I can't stop talking is like Pee Wee Herman math rock stuff. Yep. Actually, that's the song I put that reminds me of Stagger Lee. Okay. It's it honestly reminds me of like Nick Cave singing like primus that's what, the, that's what that fucking <laughs> song sounds like to me if he guessed appearance on on primus yeah. songs um yeah i dig it super i mean 220s awesome section around there um i'm fine with that one and then you get you get the rape which is uh weirdly emotional vocals over a pretty, fairly decent main riff um I, it works for me overall it's like it's i don't know it's far more digestible than they've been in a while yeah, the song title isn't. No, not the song title. No, 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 of course no, no. Not. But I, the song. So I wish I, I wish it wasn't a good, song, but it's a good song. <laughs> it is a good song. It's a cool song. Um, and then the last thing that I like on here is "Give Me the Push." I agree. Yeah, absolute ripper. Yeah, drums carry a lot of weight there, definitely. Um, but and I do think it drags a little bit too long. It's another you know, almost seven minute song, but it's fucking cool. It's fucking yeah. cool. Uh, the rest of the album it falls holds. real flat. Fuck dude. And it's not short. It's five and a half minutes, seven minutes, four and a half minutes. And you feel it. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Th those last three songs are what made me think it could have been worst. I had to go back and like remind myself like, no, there's a whole good chunk here. It just ends on such a bad lengthy note. Yeah, I was. Ha yeah, I agree. Though it does take a lot of wind out of the sails. But uh, I was just like, you know what? I kind of appreciate how weird it is yeah. when it gets heavy. I I like those it songs. Does work, yeah. So these three like me. Yeah. The, even even uh, the closer life like. Even that one, like, uh, it has this abysmal verse in this fucking awesome chorus. And it's like, oh, I'm conflicted. How do, how do I fucking, like, I love that chorus so much. But it's, it just, it lost. <laughs> the, the awesome chorus lost in the end because uh, it's just too much. It's too much. And there's all these, like, cheesy keyboards. And they're, they're pretty fucking entertaining. But the song <laughs> just kind of rubs me the wrong way, honestly. <laughs> uh but man yeah this is a i mean it's not the worst and there are good songs in there but at 72 minutes there's a lot on here that that's not great and uh did rub me the wrong way quite a bit it's so weird how 60 minutes is like i'll tolerate it but it's pushing it and then there's just something about 70 70 feels offensive <laughs> you better be hitting home runs all the fucking time 70s hard to pull off oh boy so all right you know it's not, not the best not the greatest but it still has moments uh and we have a few more left you ready yes hell yeah this is 2001 <laughs> the intro but it does pick up i promise also dark riff it is cool um, dark riff yeah the cult is kind of like just like rock and roll stuff but they're like more moodier riffs uh -huh. let's make me think of it. not anymore but yeah cool. the intro this is a rad opening riff I think about it. 
think about it all the time. Plankton. Things cross your mind. <laughs> you can't help it. What you said, <laughs> what I said. Oh what man, did, I've unleashed some did. evil into the world it's today. All in the past and, uh, now. What's the difference? Fuck. You can change it. I just wanted to get to that chorus at least once because yeah. this is a long song. It does return there a lot. It's a fucking awesome chorus. And this album rules. I think this album rules. Yeah. I don't. That song rules. Um, but then there were just some parts where I kind of lost me a little bit. Mm -hmm. But at the end, I was just like, these are. So, I was like. Please, please give me a notable worse album, and they weren't gonna fucking do it. Uh, I I wasn't expecting to like an album this much this late in in the discography. Uh, so this one felt like oh shit, like the riffs are just back, like mm -hmm. the riffs are totally back. Um, the follow up is Under the Sea, which I mean a completely different feel than than the opener. That one's one of the more repetitive songs Definitely. on here but once you get to the part with the like rolling tom fills with is it like, like 345 probably yeah there's like flanger effects it's just like no it's too good it's too yeah. fucking good it's a cool fucking song um this is they're back to long long songs yes. this is at least there's only eight of them yeah there's eight tracks same as small parts as destroyed, except now the album is much longer. It's like mm -hmm. 20 minutes longer than that album. Actually, maybe let it's just say 15 minutes longer. Yeah. And um, same amount of songs. So each song, there's like that album had three minutes, four minutes, two minutes. This one is six, six, eight, eight, six, eight, fifteen, and then four. Hell yeah. It's fucking long. So under this uh, sorry, uh, our town. It's fine, but eight minutes that I don't love at at the beginning of the album is a bit much. You know why? You weren't listening to the lyrics. What are the, what are the lyrics? Because that song, right when he said, there are whores on these streets, they ain't pretty and they ain't cheap. I was like... I remember that. Yeah, I remember that line. I want to I want to hear about this town because that sounds insane to me. That's that's how do you sell that? That's yeah. insane. Like what? What? <laughs> who would pay for that? <laughs> so that song, like I get, like I, I don't love it, but I I can get why it would it would work because uh, there are these uh, kind of dancey sections that f are so fucking good, like mm -hmm. so fucking good, but they're so infrequent. Um, and it, over the course of eight minutes, it only goes there maybe a few different times. Uh, and it, it just feels like it's it's a badly paced song. And mm -hmm. those sections aren't like highlighted in a way that I feel is, I don't know, justified. So it ends up not working for me. But uh, you get a little too high, which is fucking wacky, man. That song is crazy because there's obviously been a jazz influence but the way they've done jazz is like it it makes sense and it still makes sense here but this is the first time i'm like holy shit i think like someone has nailed like a way to do angry jazz without it sounding like too gimmicky or yeah it it was interesting the way they bought those elements together on that song so it's definitely a goofy one very quirky that's the one that really reminded me of danny elfman um, especially the vocals, Danny Alpin vocals, just f fucking. I mean, it's so entertaining though. Like, uh, it, there are parts here that dance around on the, on the dicking around side a little bit, uh, but the jump sound is fantastic. Um, it's crazy and fun enough to work, even though it is pretty fucking long. Since you brought up dicking around, I'm just gonna go straight to it. Big brew. We 
we I want to talk about the others, but we got to, we have to address Bitches Brew. They, they do a 15 minute cover of Bitches Brew with their own lyrics. Yes, and that's when I was like, these lyrics make me think of Stagerly. Yeah. Although not nearly as explicit, which is a shame. It is a shame. Those Segre is one of the fucking some of the best lyrics ever. Also, like old no means no would not tolerate this. They would make these oh, very, very explicit. Filthy, for sure. Uh w- so I haven't heard the original Bitches Brew in a long, let's just say a okay. long time. So I fucking don't remember how it goes. I don't the, remember how it sounds like it. So I, I'm not, I can't compare it to the original. The, the like biggest, like repeating element is probably the bass. Mm-hmm. But at, for a while, cause it is a 15 minute song. I was like, Oh shit. Are they going to bring in that? Like that, like trademark, like jazz keyboard, especially that's, very prominent yeah. on on bitches brew and i was so happy when they did yeah. and they bring in like congos yep they sure do they brought in um actual people to play on that song they brought in uh mark critchley and david they, who made who these fucking names critchley c-r-i-t-c-h-l-e-y and david uh mcanulty they gotta be fake m-a-c-a-n-u-l-t-y i, I hope they're fake but yeah on electric piano and, and congos uh respectively I fucking maybe I don't want to hear it every day, but it, I like it. It works for me. I might want to hear it every day. You like it that much? I do. Oh fuck, that's that's, that's big talk because you're a big bitches brew fan. Yeah, I think it's like creeped in. Again, I forget what song I said where I was like, "This is a great no means no baseline," and I was like, "No, just ever." I think it's yeah, yeah, like one of the greatest rags and bones. Yeah, it may be one of the greatest cover songs ever. Holy shit! Damn. I, I just I'm so enamored by I think I'm this enamored by that album and yeah. then to have this cool different take on the song. Yeah. Yeah, because the it doesn't I mean again I can't compare it to the original. I'm just going by how it feels um just hearing this version. Uh totally different vibes. Totally, totally, but it's fucking hypnotic and it's it, I don't know, it's just something that's really all you need. Yeah, for a song that long, that's what yeah. you need hundred percent. I dig it. I fucking dig it. Um, I don't quite dig the Stoner Rock uh, beat on the Brat Ramones cover. I love it. You love it? Not, you not the, like, sorry, I'm throwing that word, but not the same. Not the same I, level. I like it. I like it. Let me, you, yeah. Let me tone it back a little bit. It just feels like if the Melvins covered beat on the <laughs> beat on the Brat, does it not? And that's amazing. It is fun. <laughs> uh, it's it's a slower, you know, Stoner Rock version. It's cool. Um, don't love it though. But uh, the stuff that I do love, Hello Goodbye. Oh that, boy. That is this album is kind of the. It may have started on the previous album, but the this album is the start of the drummer John. He's just gonna fill all the time. He yeah he gets he's a fucking yeah we we've gushed about him I think I think we'll get the idea this dude is fucking insane I was just like. What are you? What are you fucking do? You're a fucking maniac. He sure is, and I love him. God, I mean, man, the the chorus in that song is also super fucking catchy. Like, just this across the board, the riffs here they they're just back to being great. Mm-hmm. Um, where I felt like it was pretty hit or miss in the past like three albums. Uh, so it's like, oh shit, all right. Well, they fucking pulled another good one out. I mean, that's it's pretty great. Um, and the songs are long, but it's not like crazy proggy the way it was before. They're just. They're a little bit more jammy. Yeah, I would say if you're going to do a 15 minute Bitches Brew cover, they'd smart to not go the prog prog yeah, way with yeah. other songs. Uh, this is from an interview with with John Wright, the same interview with John Wright um, that I cited a little bit earlier. The interviewer asked asked him, and he said, um, I seem to recall one generating a lot of talk, especially around those two covers, the slow version of the Ramones beat on the Brat and the version of Miles, Miles Davis's B- Bitches Brew with lyrics written by the band. Was it really that badly received? Which I didn't. Okay, I didn't think it was that bad at all. I had to make up for that right now. 100%. Uh, John said, uh, well, it wasn't a party record, but apart from maybe a little too high, the songs are pretty straightforward, but they were longer, more brooding, more vocal heavy kind of things that made it kind of a sit and listen by yourself album. It's good people talk about it. You know, it's it's a success when people think and talk. 
I like how he said that like his other albums are party. <laughs> That's true. They're all fucking really difficult. Difficult, I don't know, in quotes. You know, as compared to like uh, fucking... Zero plus two equals one. Yeah, that maybe that's that's like a party record, I guess, for these guys. Yeah, this uh this album fucking this is a solid album. They're best in a while, one of the better albums for sure. Uh but we're uh, on to their last album, not the last release, but this is the last full length. Yes. And this came out in 2006. This is All Roads Lead to Osfart. Come on, Professor Rise and Shine. This Part is so fucking cool. Yeah. And then it turns into something. It sure does. A lot of songs do that. A lot of the songs do that. <laughs> oh, fuck. Fuck, fuck, fuck. Oh, fuck. I forgot about this. I did not. It's not yeah. expecting blast beats at this point in their career. Dude. This is a fucking killer opener. Bands aren't supposed to get angrier as they... Yeah. Like I said way earlier, they've never lost the energy. No. Crazy, crazy opener, misleading as fuck opener. That is not what the album sounds like. Worst, least, favorite. I almost gave this best. Are you crazy? How? The, oh, this was an, like it became an easy worst for me. I I wish I I felt that way about that. Maybe not this one. I I think I'm just so enamored with John's playing on this. He is always amazing and he is just as amazing here as ever 100 it's like so bonkers i think there are some lows but i'm just like i th- i think they're mi- like maniacs in a different way on here well the thing is this is pretty much like their pop punk album i uh, it's like the most pop punk they've ever been m- m- almost like pretty much more than they'll ever be i didn't i did not feel that oh my god it's so dude fucking in her eyes Oh, ooh, I that's I mean, that's a fun course, but God damn, that is pop punky as shit. I think the like fast talking, like talk singing parts make it not. But yeah, there is like powerful triumphant vocals on there. I mean, I think I mean uh, more riff wise. The vocals, mm. uh, Rob is still fucking nutty. Yeah. Um, but riff wise, it, it's it's way more straightforward. Um, it has like the. It's one of the faster albums for sure, but it is definitely one of the more straightforward. Yeah. And and the things I like here, there are very few. It's the opener, Wake Up, which fucking rules. Um, I do like I See a Mansion in the Sky. Um, and it, it is also, incidentally, the most Devo they will ever sound. That Those those vocal choices are, are or the singing is wild in yeah. there. Um, and then I... F- that's when the guitar tones at times I was like fucking rumble. Oh, okay. Um, uh, I think around two and a half minutes is when I think when things take a, a massive Devo turn this time with Nick cave vocals, uh, and it has this really cool, uh, outro with a slide guitar, which I've never fucking heard with this band before. Uh, but the parts I love about it are mostly due to my love for Devo. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then the other song I'm okay with is heaven is the dust, but, Beneath My Shoes, um, seven minutes, uh, starts out pretty country western, cow punk, a um, little bit on the on the darker, sad side, and then vocals coming in, and it gets extremely Captain Beefheart. I also like that song a lot. I like the noisy guitar line with the spoken word stuff. Um, yeah. It's a very like neat, noisier guitar riff. Um, and then around the five minute mark, for some reason, you get like guitarmony oh, uh, stuff and it's just, yeah really yeah. strong moving moments in there 
Now, everything else, <laughs> I either am bored to death or I dislike. First of all, Solo is like them doing Beach Boys with robot vocals. So, of course, I'm in. So, I knew the robot vocals would get you. you they I, usually do. But it, it so it is a cute and fun song, yeah. but in a, like, in a grease way, which means I hate it. Yeah. <laughs> Just the like Beach Boys grease thing. Uh, the the robot vocals were the the cherry on top that, for me. <laughs> it's so goofy. It's it's grease put with robots. That's basically what it what solo is. Uh, Ashes. Another. It's another song that like v- the vocals really remind me of Danzig. Mm. Uh, also, kind of a funny coincidence because there's a Danzig song called Ashes um, from the techno album Black Acid Devil. Ooh, that was long, oh, long yeah. time ago. Check out that episode. Uh, I don't find it all that that interesting. Uh, what was it? Mr. In-Between is just kind of surf-inspired punk. Uh, how do you feel about Faith? Faith, I I like it. I think it rules. It's, you know, it's not as, as epic as some of their other songs, but I think it works on this album, and I enjoy it. Yeah, um, I mean, it's super Arabian Nights. Uh, That's probably why I liked it. Yeah, I don't love it. Uh, dude, there's like one section on 215 that I that I think is pretty rad. They do do like an Arabian Nights thing better. Later. Yes. Yeah, sure. Yeah, I know what you're talking about. But yeah, it, wor- it works for me in the context of this album. Mm-hmm. Uh, where am I saying? Oh, okay, so the, the stuff that I, I do not like, there's a few. Uh-huh. <sighs> Mono Nihilissimo 2000. I mean, Jesus Christ, what a song. I mean, it, what to be a fair, song to be, to be fair. It's what like a song. Nothing like anything they've ever done. What a song. <laughs> it's, it's like folk punk with these female like rapping sections. Yeah. And they're singing about fucking children. Don't play this song around normal <laughs> Didn't people. Didn't even catch that. I was too busy hating the song. <laughs> the like female vocal parts caught me off guard. And then he started you know, singing about kid fucking. And I'm like, this is their, this is their solo. Oh, <laughs> wait, how do you spell that? S a L O. Yeah. So it's a low solo. Yeah. That, I always try to remember the fucking name of that movie. And I keep forgetting scarred into my memory. I had a very long conversation with our guy, Tom Osmond and his girlfriend in Germany about Tom, that movie. Tom would watch that movie. He did with her and <laughs> she got mad. Oh, and she should. <laughs> she, t- I'm not gonna, Tom's girlfriend is an angel. She's, she's a gnarly chick though. She can handle it. She's, she's pretty gnarly. But we had a very long conversation about that movie. <laughs> you can just watch that movie once and you'll remember everything. It's so it's so I have no desire personally to watch that movie. <laughs> I'm glad I watched that movie when I was young because now I'm just like, ah, I'm just ah, be- I don't. Yeah. But one of my favorite things ever is uh, Bill Hader and the Criterion channel youtube picking out movies and him just straight face no context picking that movie out and saying it's one of the greatest comedies ever and no other context oh that's great god damn (laughs) fucked up super fucked up anyways back to this album which i find to be as traumatizing as that movie uh the hawk killed the punk look these guys it's so impressive that they're this fucking the, the, not an ounce of energy has left them this late in the career, but I, it just feels like they're copying themselves at this point. Like, I mean, there's one section on one fifteen that I think is pretty cool, but it's it's just stuff that they haven't. It's, it's nothing they haven't done already. Um, there there are songs like that where I noted like this is kind of like par for the course. Yeah, but how fucking spoiled are we that this is the course? I suppose the only other thing on here that I would say I I dislike is till i die i think it fucking blows (laughs) that is them channeling their like punk roots it uh almost doesn't have a place on the album if i want to be i kind of i mean to me it's more corny pirate music that's what it feels like yeah that's because you know what yeah we're gonna make Mike, listen to more more pennywise fuck yeah i guess you're right (laughs) i mean in that sense on the pop year, not, not that Pennywise is pop punk, but it's closer to pop punk than no means no. Yes. Nowhere. yes. Um, 
they're really also they're really leaning into that cowpunk beat on this album. Slugs are burning is another example of that more poppy punk stuff. Um, it's not the worst, but I just don't like the direction they're going. It feels like you guys are better than this. You guys can do better than this. This feels so average. Uh, and then the closer, I don't, I, it might be like a one of those hidden CD tracks. I'm mm. not sure, but it's the future of the past, and it is a legitimate novelty song. Yes. What, what do you know the name of the the song that they're they're doing? I do not, but yeah, I wrote that it was like one of those like traditional. Yeah. Yeah. It's that thing, but played with like ukulele and it's really fast. Um, it's cute, but you know, you know, I'm surprised they don't have more outright silly songs like that. Yeah. They have stuff that, that teeters on silly and goofy, but it's always, or like, it's like wacky, but yeah. yeah, there's a level of sincerity to it. Or there's this like overall picture where this is this. Hey, yeah this is overtly silly yeah very few where it's just jokey jokey this album is clearly a lot different than one uh it's way it's the songs are more digestible they're way shorter of course faster punkier um which alex likes but i don't uh but also if if you're a drummer sure there's more sonically pleasing songs but if, I, I think if you're a drummer, you have to listen to this album. He, it is impressive. He is fucking wild. He is. He's on a like crazy level here. I don't want to call it his a game, but it's a it's a crazy level. He is truly one of the best fucking drummers. It's like watching Jordan go off on the Wizards or something like you didn't need to do that. <laughs> well, I think they needed it. But, yeah. Uh, John says in regards to this album, he said, um, after Dance of the Headless Bourgeoisie, which was a fairly strange album, and then one, which I happen to really like, but not a lot of people did, fucking baffling to me, uh, we decided to do a short album, under 50 minutes, <laughs> short album, huh, buddy? With 10 to 12 songs that are catchy and make oh, a bit of an easier album. There it is. So they went in uh, deliberately trying to make this an easier album. By the way, this is 53 minutes. It's not under 50 minutes. He's like shit. That's that's why it sucks. They didn't get out of the, the 50 minute mark. Uh, but yeah, uh, Alex is one of his favorite drum albums from the band. My worst and least favorite. I find it just boring more than anything. I, th- I think this stands firmly in average territory, which is an insulting thing from a, for a band like this. I, I need to revisit this like 34 years from now. Yeah, yeah. Well, we're due for other albums and other yeah. bands for sure. Uh, but we have two more records. Their last two records that both came out the same year. Uh, we'll do them separately because they are very different EPs, but they are a package deal pretty much. So this one came out in 2010, and it is Tour EP1, a.k.a. Old. These EPs sound amazing. Really? I think this one sounds good. I think the next one does not. Oh, okay. Maybe I was just so drunk off this one I didn't notice Maybe. the different production. Yeah. It's it's slight. She lives in a cave like a floating rock. Dude, collective vocals are at an all time high. If she had yeah. eyes, <laughs> they'd be bright and wide. And the pitch black night. It's also like Nick Cave. Yep. Definitely. She had ears the silence would hear the steps of a hunter creeping near but she has no features she's funny that way dear little faceless May dear little faceless May she reminds me of dear little faceless May Ian Curtis right there in this line dear little faceless oh, yeah. May I was trying to remember who it sounded like to me. Dear I just remembered right now. So this is not the last album. This sounds nothing like the last album. I, after like the like nonstop, like breakneck speed of the last album, this is like so awesome. This having this almost minimal yeah, it, approach. It feels very minimal. Uh, this is actually the, the most minimal they've ever been on and these it's, EPs. It's not even 
minimal may not even be the right word no but compared com- to exactly yeah. um i don't actually i'm i like that opener just because it feels different i don't like the song itself uh, i'm kind of fine with it mm-hmm. uh slave i do like and even old i like quite a bit actually I actually like old a lot i i think this is one of the these uh, things where maybe individually these songs aren't super strong on their own, but packaged together. I, I love the whole package overall. It's this slower, chunkier sludgy thing. Mm -hmm. And yeah, it's awesome. It's like, I, I needed, I needed this kind of music. Interesting. Uh, Slave is an interesting one. It has like a lot of false starts to it, uh, and get, it's got a cool southern twang. Um, it eventually builds up, and it starts to feel really good around like a minute fifty mm-hmm. is when things start to really kind of come together. Uh, yeah, I was big on that one. And then old is a fucking eight minute epic. Uh, these big harmonized vocals. You can actually hear how old they are at this point. Like yeah. the first time you can really tell. Um, but uh, you know, slow and epic, really drawn out sections. I fucking dig it. It's very cool. And then you mentioned it before, the Arabian Nights. I something dark against something light. Yeah, fucking amazing. Oh, I, I don't like it. You like that? You love I lo- it. You love I love, it. love it. I love it. It's full on Egyptian. It's like the most Egyptian thing they've ever done. It's. Yeah, it's the like most psychedelic thing they've done, and yeah, it's one of my favorite songs. Holy them. shit! Yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't, I definitely don't hate it. I was, I also was caught off guard by that because, like I said, the the other songs have this like slower, like grinded yeah. out feel to them, and this is just full yeah. whims, psychedelic Middle Eastern stuff. Goes right into it. It's the most energy on anything here. The drums are more tribal drums, but I think they sound great on there. Um, it's a little—I find it to be a little hokey. It's not the worst thing ever. It's but it's fun. Uh, it just gets old for me. I think that's all my main problem with it. It's the best thing ever for me. <laughs> it's the best thing ever for Alex. Uh, but I was pleased to hear this following the last album, especially because I did not enjoy the last album. Um, but I was missing the aside from old. I think it was missing some kind of hooks for me. Uh, but it, it, it feels older. Like it feels calmer and slower and less wild it is not a hooky ep by any means no no old is the closest thing but uh at this point even even that like yeah right you know at at 2010 they've been at this (laughs) since 81 fucking good on them fuck it i also i just think it's like perfect putting these out as eps too yeah um, according to Tom here, it says it was. Uh, he says it was originally planned as the first of four EPs, but they never completed the set, um, which makes me wonder. I couldn't find any other um, quotes about it, uh, so I don't, I don't. I wonder what happened there. But yeah, I think they just got tired, and yeah, there was a pretty big gap between these and when they broke up. But uh, we have one more last EP, same year. Uh, last thing we'll ever get from these guys. And uh, here it is. This is Tour EP2, a.k.a. Jubilation. Again, just completely different. Jubilant sounding. Lyrics, not so much so. Oh, shocker. This drum sound like fucking dick. You know what? You're right. I, I don't know why they sound I don't know where that punch went from the last CP. Yeah. They sound like they're like recorded over the phone. And all the members of my favorite band, they're all dead. So this feels a little bit more like a Rosie to Oscar kind of stuff. Yeah. Nothing left to hang on to in this wicked world. That's liberation. So very, it's pretty pop punky. Uh, and this EP was real close to being worse. <laughs> this EP, it just felt kind of <laughs> felt kind of lazy for me to give it that. Cause. That's what I felt too. Uh, it might be worse on a song for song kind of thing, mm-hmm. but it's so. It's, I mean, it's twenty something. It's like twenty five minutes, which is still a little long for this EP. Uh, and I think it, it legitimately has no good songs and one of the worst songs they've ever done, which is 
uh, all all the little bourgeois dreams. Um, I think it's one of their worst songs ever. I don't think these songs do the thing where all the bourgeois dreams and um, one in the same. Yeah. I did not care for them. Yeah. And then they do something and I'm like, I like it. Really? On those songs. And uh, all the little. Yeah. Uh, bourgeois. Uh, once it does the, the drum solo. Oh, the drum. Yeah. The drum solo is the best part of the easily the best part of it the song. It just turns the whole song around for me. It would. It. <sighs> I thought about that and I'm like, this is like, this is truly an incredible drum solo. Yeah. I can't, I couldn't like, it's the only, <laughs> it's the only part of the song that I, I think isn't a pile of shit. <laughs> the beat, the beat is good outside of it, but it's one of the few, like, especially in this later era where it's real or repetitive. Yeah. It's still a very unique beat, but it's it's repetitive for what he's been laying down. Yeah. One of the same is more goofy and groovy. Um, it's kind of sleazy. It's a little bit basic. It's not the worst thing ever, but after a while, I'm like so just bothered by that main riff. I thought, again, I was it went on a little too for a little too long. I was like, yeah. I don't care about this song. But then it starts picking up some steam getting a little faster yeah getting a little meaner and i'm like ah, that's the second half of this songs is so much more interesting than the first half it's like almost night and day the the, the performances on here are still so fucking incredible like it was a little bit more subdued on on the tour ep1 but here it's like, oh, no, they're still super energetic and super crazy mm-hmm. and super tight. Uh, so it's pretty impressive. But you get um, Prambulate, which was, uh, I believe, it was an outtake from from Osfart. That's cr- yeah, that's crazy because that's the best song on here. So I don't like any song in here, but you're I probably agree with that. <laughs> it's it's also like appropriate where I love the last yeah. song on the last and then it's the same one here i love the like ebbs and flows that's mm. it goes through i i think the like burst of energy when it does have it is appropriate i you know what on two eps i got like two legitimate bangers for me this is good enough Work, works for you what does that course remind you of when he yells what is what does that remind you of i don't because I'm thinking, like, does it remind me of music or does it just, does it just remind me of fucking Paul Bearer? <laughs> it might just be Paul Bearer. I wish I wish I thought of Paul Bearer because I, I mean, think that's I think that's what I'm thinking of. <laughs> maybe anytime I get a chance to talk about wrestling, I would have. So, oh, God, imagine that guy singing these songs. Oh, my God. Uh, Is Paul Bearer singing any song. Would... Oh, he's dead, right? Yeah. Uh, poor guy. How uh, epic. How epic would it be if you got to be a Paul Bearer at Paul Bearer's funeral? I don't know. If, I think we need a few of us in order to, to pull that one off. Sure. But like there's only like 10 people that get to say they were able to. Do. That's true. That's true. Paul Bearer's Paul Bearer. Yeah. yeah. 100%. How, uh, how old were you when you realized that was a, like joke name? Oh, probably too old. Too old. Yeah, yeah same. for sure. Same. <laughs> you, know, you know what it was? It was when someone actually... The first, it, I heard the name Paul Bearer, Bearer before I heard of the term Paul Bearer. Yes, same. So when someone said, oh, he, he was gonna, someone was going to be a Paul Bearer, I'm like, he's going to be the urn <laughs> holder for The Undertaker. <laughs> what do you, wait, what do you mean? <laughs> One time I passed a, uh, a like science and anatomy test. This because they asked, where is the mandible located? I was like, motherfucker. It's by the claw, dude. It's <laughs> duh. I know where that is. <laughs> Hell yeah. Uh, but yeah, I find this to be one of the w- w- weakest releases, period, across the board. This was this was a strong contender for worst. But uh, Alex found some love on there. I have a lot, a lot of feelings about this band that I'm going to sort out over the coming years. Yeah, yeah. Get some more definitive feelings. But the band officially split on September 24th, 2016. Um, and John announced it on Facebook. He said right here, greetings, everybody. John here from uh, No Man's No. And with a heavy heart, 
I must announce the retirement of no means no. A hiatus became a long hiatus and a lingering hiatus has become a permanent one. 35 years and countless miles, a couple thousand shows and many more beers, a bunch of tunes and sweaty hordes of great fans. I can't say thanks enough to everyone. I'll continue to post here on our page about the robots and future projects if and when they happen. He does a side project with John, sorry, with, with Rob, uh, a Berlin, I think it's Berlin based uh, robot band. They they write they make music for robots to play and perform. It's pretty fucking wacky. I like it. Turn the script Indeed. instead of having robots do AI. F- we're we're doing per- it for the robots. There we go. I like it. Uh, hoping to have the debut Compressor Head album out by next March. So you have not heard the last of things yet. So cheers, everyone. Raise a glass. XO. Yeah, I believe. Uh, Tom, uh, guitar guitarist Tom. He left a few months before that. And then mm. they split. They announced the split afterward. But we made it to the fucking end. Holy shit. I hope you all fuckers enjoyed us digging into this band that you've been bugging us about. Although I do like the band quite a bit. I love the band. Alex loves the band. We are now. Well, I mean, I've always been a fan, but we are now fucking fans, dog. Fans. Fans, dude. For, 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 for life. For life. For life. For life. Uh, let's do a little recap. Uh, you know what? I, worst least favorite mama. I don't even feel good about that anymore. <laughs> but whatever, <laughs> whatever. It's my first first day at the job. It's first day. Uh, be- best wrong. It's I don't even care. It's cliche. It fucking rips. Fucking rips. Personal zero plus two equals one. Only familiarity I had with the band. And it feels good. Feels good. Yeah. Uh, for me, small parts isolated and destroyed. Personal favorite. I go way back. I have such a fucking deep love for that. Plus, the songwriting is incredible. And it's the only, like, epic sludge punk thing. Epic, triumphant, and themic sludge punk album I can think of. Just period. It's fucking great. Uh, wrong. Best. I'm sorry. But it's just the best. It's just <laughs> too goddamn consistent. Too fucking amazing. And worst. Least. Favorite, all roads lead to Oz Fart because, God damn it, I don't like pop punk. I felt a lot of it on there. It's boring. It's the only time they're boring. They're such an amazing band, and it's the only time I was just truly fucking bored. Thank you so much for listening and watching and hanging out. If you want to hang out with us further, subscribe. Hang out with us, please. We need friends. Talk some shit to us in the comments if you think we're retarded. I'm sure you have grounds, too. Or maybe you don't, and you're just a mean person. I don't fucking know. Just write something uh you can follow me on all social media at pander monkey and alex on instagram at every album alex hell yes please follow our history at tom osmond at tom osmond sounds on all social media as well as tom osmond sounds.com for all his music check out his records with existing non-existent as well as his solo album there's links to all those in the description it's fucking cool stuff uh please 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 join the patreon all right join the patreon patreon.com slash every album ever that's where you get some bonus episodes. You get to see our schedule in advance. You get to join our uh, Discord and be a part of our community. Uh, you get to fucking vote on polls to decide who we cover next. Uh, we also pick out our EAE, single, EAE singles episodes from the Discord. So go ahead there to do that. If you're tier two, just like Slade, as well as many others that requested this album, you can request a full, or sorry, requested this band. Uh, you can request a full discography for us to cover. Uh, yeah, I mean, everyone wanted this uh, this fucking band, and it's uh, y'all better tell your friends, tell your family. That's right. That's a pretty word, baby. Fucking over over one k views on this motherfucker. That's right. We're aiming high. We're aiming for the stars. Uh, so yeah, go there. Go there if you want to do that. It's fucking cool. Uh, I think that's about it. Uh, Check out my EP. There's a link to that in the description. Go ahead, do that. Uh, I think that's about it. Yeah, just turn into Yoda and <laughs> sign, sign off. It's time to sign off. So what the fuck are we listening to? That's all you. It's an easy, easy choice for me, baby. Good. Easy choice out of no matter how many fucking countless amazing songs these guys have, my heart will always say junk. Mm-mm-mm. So let's do it, baby. Thank you so much for listening and watching. See ya.